Welcome to the first ever Trinity Radio Debate. And I'm excited about this. This is going to be wonderful. We have, I think, what's going to be a um, exciting, engaging debate between brothers. This is an in-house debate. And one thing that I hope that Christians will get out of this is a desire to go further with their own interest in theological studies and biblical studies, but also for unbelievers out there. I know we have a lot of atheists in our audience, and one thing that I'd like for the atheists and other unbelievers to get out of this is that you don't have to stop thinking when you become a Christian. You don't have to check your brain at the door, and it is not the end to asking questions. In fact, it's only the beginning, as there are many great, deep theological and biblical questions that we can ask that the church has been wrestling with throughout the history of the church. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? How are they different, and in what sense are they? Throughout the history of the church, this question has spawned debates regarding the end times, the nature of salvation, and what promises of God are yet to be realized. But at the foundation of these discussions lies the question of what exactly the New Testament authors might have meant when they referred to Israel, and whether in some sense they might have used the designation for the church at large, both Jew and Gentile. I'm so excited about both of our debaters today who are going to be engaging on this exciting topic because they are both friends of mine, both brothers in Christ. This is, in that sense, a little bit of an intramural discussion between believers. They both consider each other brothers, and they uh, have many similarities, doctrinally speaking, yet they differ on this issue. Chris Date, who will be going first tonight, is uh, a professor at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. He teaches our biblical languages courses, and he is a recent uh, graduate of a great school and has uh, just a matchless track record, a wonderful uh, series of books and articles that he's written. He's also uh, the director, I guess would be the right term, for Rethinking Hell, which is a ministry and conference that is related to the question of what the nature of hell actually is. I'm very excited about Chris, and, uh, and, and I'm glad that he is one of the two debaters. Uh, what a great spirit he has, and what an incredible debater he is. We also have tonight Steve Gregg. Steve Gregg is almost singularly responsible for a break I took from apologetics several years ago for three years. Um, I was still teaching apologetics at Trinity, but I wanted to go deeper with the Bible, and it's because of the conviction that the Holy Spirit brought through the words of Steve Gregg. His Bible teaching is incredible. He has a verse-by-verse -verse through the entire Bible on his website, The Narrow Path, and I hope that you will check it out, and the links to both of these men's ministries and channels are in the description to this video, but don't check them out now. Uh, Steve Gregg is a radio personality. He has worked with um, missions organizations to travel all around the world teaching the Bible. And so this, this man is a real hero to me. And so who do I hope is going to win? It's very difficult because I love both of these men so much. So I'm excited that all of you all have chosen to be here as well. And I think we're going to have a good time together. The structure of the debate is going to be uh, pretty formal. What we're going to do is we're going to have 20-minute opening statements, 10-minute cross, 10-minute uh, rebuttals, I'm sorry, 10-minute cross-examinations apiece, uh, five-minute closing statements, and then there'll be a 30-minute period of audience Q&A. So if you have questions, hold them, and I'll let you know maybe just before the closings that you should start asking those questions. And if you'll put in all caps, question, right before you ask the question in the live chat, we'll try to make sure to get those in there. Um, Chris is going to be going first. Uh, the, uh, he's going to be taking the negative position, uh, and he's going to get 20 minutes. Then he'll be followed by Steve, and we'll proceed from there. I'll let you know who's going when, and it's going to be hopefully an exciting night together. Again, thank you all for showing up. Thank you for all for being interested in these important questions. And with that, we won't spend too much time uh, on, on these formalities. We'll try to jump right into it. Would appreciate it if you'd subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. It doesn't cost you a dime, but of course, we don't require that. So uh, here are our debaters. We are excited that they're in the house. And first, we're going to begin with Chris Date, who you see in the bottom left-hand side of the screen there. And so, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you make your introductions and begin with your 20-minute opening statements. 
Thanks, Braxton. I want to begin by thanking my opponent, Steve, for his friendship and for his ministry. This picture up on the screen on the left is from about eight years ago. It's it's us and our mutual friend, John Johnson. We enjoyed a lunch or a dinner at Azteca, and I have fond memories of that. And I also still have my signed copy of Steve's Revelation 4 Views, a parallel commentary, which was very formative for me as a young preterist. So uh, again, thanks to Steve for his friendship and ministry, and that's going to really help temper the extreme nervousness that I'm experiencing right now. So we'll see how things go. To make clear, uh, I want to I want to start by explaining what it is that I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that dispensational eschatology is true. Indeed, I'm known for being a preterist and an amillennialist. I'm also not arguing that Christians should support the state of Israel over other nations and peoples, or that Christians should support their claim to the Holy Land, or that prophecies yet to be fulfilled are concerned particularly with Israel. I may believe some of these, but they are d independent propositions that you viewers can reject, even if you accept my case in this debate. What I am arguing is that Israel is specifically Jacob and his descendants, as well as possibly Gentile converts to Judaism. So if this large circle in this Venn diagram is humankind, the smaller circle represents the subset of humanity known as Israel. Secondly, I'll be arguing that the church is believers in Jesus from among both Israel and the Gentiles. So here's another subset of humanity that overlaps with the first, uh, this second subset being uh, the church. Finally, I will argue that Israel in quotes, that is true spiritual Israel, is the remnant of Israel that believes in Jesus, uh, that remnant being represented by the uh, overlap between the church and Israel. Now, I just said a moment ago that if you accept my case, it doesn't commit you to the, any of other peculiar dispensationalist views. So why this specific question? Why does it matter? Well, firstly, it matters because if I'm right, calling the church true or spiritual Israel and Gentile believers true or spiritual Jews offends Jewish people unnecessarily, inhibiting their salvation. It also matters because the meaning of even just a single, seemingly straightforward word can greatly impact larger debates. Think, for example, of the word prognosco or foreknew in Romans 8, 29 and 30, and how that impacts the larger Calvinism versus non-Calvinism debate. Uh, and thirdly, when you start off course on a trajectory by just a little bit, you can end up missing your desired destination by a whole lot. The famous one in 60 rule, for example, says that if you're just one degree off to start, you'll be a mile off after every 60 miles. So I think a very narrowed, very focused question like this is worth having before debating the other relevant issues, which Steve and I may do in a future debate, uh, whether here on Trinity Radio or elsewhere. So let me begin by making my case that Israel is not the church. First, Israel and Jew consistently refer to the Jewish people in the New Testament. The words Israel and Israelite are used some 77 times in the New Testament, 71 of which are clear references to the Jewish people. Uh, seven, uh, three of those 77 occurrences are references to the land identified with the Jewish people, and that leaves just three of 77 occurrences, or 4%, that are alleged by some to refer to the church. I contend that it's more likely that the few disputed uses are related to the many undisputed ones referring to the believing remnant of Israel, rather than radically different uses altogether. Similarly, the word Jew is used some 195 times in the New Testament, 189 of which are clear references to the Jewish people. Two of the other occurrences are references to the land identified with the Jewish people, leaving just four of 195 occurrences, or approximately 2%, that are alleged by some to refer to the church. Again, I contend it's more likely that the few disputed uses are related to the many undisputed ones rather than to believing or referring to believing remnant Jews rather than radically different uses altogether. Second, Israel and the church are differentiated without qualification in the New Testament. In Romans 9, 30 and 31, which speaks of believing Gentiles versus Israel, uh, versus Israel Romans 11, 7, 11 and 25, Israel versus the Gentiles, 1 Corinthians 10, 17 to 18 and 32 contrasts the Israel with believers, uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 12 and 36. All of these texts, in, in, and even Revelation 7, 4 to 9, which first talks of 144,000 from Israel and then a great multitude that no one could number from Every nation, these are all of these texts differentiate without qualification between Israel and the church, which suggests that you can't just call the church Israel. 
Similarly and thirdly, Jew and Gentile believers are differentiated without qualification in the New Testament. Uh, in Acts 21.20, Romans 1.16, Romans 3.29 and 30, Romans 9.24, 1 Corinthians 1.24, uh, 1 Corinthians 12.13, Galatians 2.12-13, and Ephesians 3.1 all refer to Jewish believers or Gentile believers or both without qualification, making it really questionable whether you can call Gentile believers Jews. Fourth and finally, and this will, this will constitute the bulk of my case, in just a few New Testament texts, is, words like Israel and Jew are Midrashic references to remnant Jews. By Midrashic references, I'm referring to what Richard Longenecker calls Jewish interpretive rules or conventions that Paul probably learned in his early training as a Pharisee. Paul probably also learned them from his teacher Gamaliel, who learned them from his teacher Hillel, to whom many Midrashic rules of uh, interpretation are attributed. This includes the rule known as pearl stringing, which Longenecker sees Paul using in Romans 9 to 11 to substantiate the presence of a remnant of Jewish people throughout history. Um, so for example, Isaiah 10, 20 to 22, Jeremiah 50, 20, Micah 2, 12, Micah 5, 7 to 8, Zechariah 8, 7 to 8, and 12 to 13, all of these texts refer to the larger group of Israel, only a small subset or remnant of which are faithful to God or will be faithful to God. And so Paul says in Romans 9, 6, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. This doesn't mean that there are those who aren't descended from Israel who do belong to Israel. No, he's talking about the remnant that he goes on to speak of in verse 27, and then again in chapter 11, verses 2 to 15, where he says God has not rejected his people, there, there is a remnant. Um, and so Thomas Schreiner rightly observes that Israel is restricted in these chapters to ethnic Jews who believe in Jesus, or at least Israel in quotes. Uh, Roman, nowhere in Romans 9 to 11 is the term Israel transferred to the church, and this is also the view of Douglas Moo, uh, Ben Witherington, and several other commentators. Paul also does a similar midrash, midrash in uh, Romans 2 when he refers to the circumcision of the heart. He's, refer, he's alluding to such Old Testament passages as Deutero, uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16 and 36, and Jeremiah 4, 4 and 9, 25 to 26, which are texts that speak of a larger uncircumcised by heart group and then a smaller circumcised in heart group uh, either then or in the future. This thought is developed in the intertestamental literature, such as Jubilees 1, 22 to 23, and in the Odes of Solomon, this inward circumcision of the heart is linked to the work of the Holy Spirit. So you can see, you can see that all of these things are being alluded to when Paul says in Romans 8, uh, 2, 28 and 29, that circumcision isn't outward, it's a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Of course, Paul also says here that no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, a Jew is one inwardly. And some have taken this to mean that Gentiles who are circumcised of the heart are Jews in some sense. But no, that's not the case. Alvin McLean rightly identifies that what this teaches is that not every Jew is in fact a Jew. It's again, it's talking about the larger Jewish population, only a subset of which are believing Jews. That's also the view of Colin Cruz and Joseph Fitzmaier and Rene Lopez, among others. This is also uh, consistent with the Jewish context of this passage. As this sampling of um, commentaries demonstrates, the earlier text in Romans is directed to Gentiles, whereas in this portion of Paul's letter, he's speaking to Jews. And so Arnold Fruchtenbaum rightly says, the, we've got to take the, the context into consideration. Paul is dealing with Jews, and his distinction is not between Jews uh, who are, do not believe and Gentiles who do, it's between Jews who don't believe and Jews who do. This is what's going on as well in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, where Jesus in his letters to the churches speaks of those who say they are Jews and are not. The implication here is not that there are Gentile Christians who are Jews. Rather, it's again this concept that there are members of the um, House of Israel that are not truly Jewish. That's the view of Robert Mounts, Craig Coaster, John MacArthur, Mist Fanning, and Craig Keener, among others. Now, in Ephesians 2.12, Paul says to Gentiles that you once were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were once far off and have been brought near. And some have taken this to mean that where they've been brought near to, indeed entered into, is that commonwealth of Israel. But no, that's not the case. Ben Witherington rightly explains that it's odd that Paul would call the group of Jew and Gentile united in Christ the commonwealth or politeia of Israel, which suggests a political entity. He goes on to say it's reasonably clear that Paul is saying that Gentiles have become part of the community of God's people through Christ. 
Uh, Andrew Lincoln also says that this community of God's people is a newly created community, not a pre-existing one into which Gentiles have been added. Uh, and he substantiates this from verses 19 to 22, in which Paul says that both groups are members of the household of God, joined together, built together, not simply one group grafted into the other. Indeed, Daryl Bach agrees the picture is not of Gentiles becoming Jews or simply moving into their space. Rather, they are being brought into something new, the one new man, not a pre-existing man. Um, and that's what Paul says in uh, verses 15 and 16, right after the Israel of, or af after the uh, Commonwealth of Israel reference. He says he's made the both into one new man in place of the two. Um, this is also what's going on with Paul's olive branch now or olive tree analogy in Romans 11:17, where he says that Gentiles have been grafted in among the natural branches of the tree. Again, some have taken this to mean that um, Gentiles have been grafted into Israel because Israel is represented by an olive tree at, in places in the Old Testament. But again, that's a misunderstanding. As Thomas Schreiner rightly acknowledges, the olive tree here is better described as the people of God, that new man that Paul speaks of in Ephesians, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. This is also, also the view of Grant Osborne. Sarah Lancaster explains why the olive tree analogy is used to describe the people of God. It's because Gentiles have been brought into the relationship with God that God had established and maintained with Israel originally. And so Arnold Fruchtenbaum sees the olive tree as not representing Israel or the church, but representing a place of spiritual blessing, um, the root of which is the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, and this is consistent with um, what Rene Lopez also identifies here, that Gentiles are grafted in among, are grafted into the place of blessing by becoming God's people, as Paul had said earlier in chapter 9. So that brings us to the quintessential Israel is the church or the church is Israel text, Gal Galatians 6.16. Every single person who thinks that the church is in some sense Israel cites this text in support. Um, the Some translations like the NIV, the NLT, and the RSV seem to indicate that Paul is speaking of the same group twice. Peace and mercy, the NIV says, to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. Uh, and then other, those other translations do something similar. L uh, Longenecker explains that this reflects the view that the second chi or and should be seen as explicative or epexegetical. Um, so it clarifies the meaning of the group, the first group, those who follow this rule, even on, or that is, the Israel of God. But most translations preserve the normative meaning of the conjunction chi, uh, the ESV, the NASB, and a number of others. And they read more like peace and mercy be upon them, those who follow the rule, and upon the Israel of God. And while this doesn't necessitate my reading, it does lend itself to mine. And I'm going to make an argument for my reading of the text now, which is that the Israel of God refers to believing Jews, not to believing Christians or, or believing Gentiles or Jews. Uh, my case is thus. First, nowhere else in all of Scripture is the church called Israel. I've already gone over this. Second, Paul's creative uses of Israel and Jew elsewhere narrow their scope rather than expand it. Again, I've already covered this. Thirdly, the closing benediction of his letter is an unlikely place for Paul to offer a radical redefinition of Israel. Uh, Timothy George explains this point. He says it's strange that Paul would make this crucial identification here at the end of his letter in a benediction and not in the main body where he developed at length his argument for justification by faith. Stranger still, Timothy George goes on to say, Paul did not put this potent expression to use in his magisterial exposition on the role of his Israel in salvation history in Romans 9 to 11. Indeed, that's very curious. Uh, curiouser still, Robert Saucy points out that Galatians may very well be the first of Paul's extant writings. So why do we not see this meaning of Israel of God, uh, that is, as the church, um, f found in Paul's many uses of the word elsewhere in his later extant letters? That does not seem very likely. Fourthly, such a jarring radical redefinition would defeat Paul's purposes in this letter, a letter meant to unite Jewish and Gentile believers rather than divide them. You see, Paul had said earlier in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, you are all one in Christ. Of course, he doesn't say there is only Jews, some of which are actually Greeks. No, he's saying there isn't Jew or Greek. There's no salvific distinction between the two. They're all one in Christ. Of course, Paul will elsewhere say there is a distinction between male and female, not salvifically, but in other roles, in other, in other areas. Um, and so likewise, there's nothing here that indicates there literally is no distinction between Jew or Greek. It's just not salvific. Um, Peter Richardson explains that to prevent the Galatians from moving to a new Christian exclusiveness and sectarianism, Paul adds his prayer for mercy on God's faithful people, Israel. 
You see, he's trying to prevent the Gentiles from being prideful about their role. This is also what Robert Saucy explains, that these words in 616 prevent the Gentiles from an attitude of pride. So he's trying to preserve unity. It's also, though, Saucy explains, to encourage the faithful Jews among them. Or as S. Lewis Johnson puts it, near the end of this letter with its harsh and forceful attack on the Judaists, Paul tempers his language with a special blessing for faithful believing Israelites. So you see, he's trying to prevent the Gentile believers from being prideful against Israel, and he's trying to, to make clear that in his condemnations of Israel earlier in the letter, it's, he's not condemning believing Jews. He's trying to unite the two groups, not further divide them, as would be the the case if he was offering such a radical redefinition of the word. Fifthly, the word chi, translated and normally, is seldom explicative, and when followed by a repeated preposition, it enumerates items in a list, which is its far more common use. This is the point that Johnson makes um, in his book when he says an extremely rare usage. He laments the fact that um, what has happened is that an extremely rare usage of the conjunction has been made to replace its common usage um, uh, when the common usage of the word, simply and, uh, its frequent usage makes perfect good sense here. But it's not just the, the, the normative uses of the word and, it's also that repeated uh, preposition. You see in the text, um, the preposition appears twice. Peace and mercy be upon them, and then there's and, chi, and then the preposition is repeated again, the, uh, upon the Israel of God. And everywhere else in the New Testament that this structure is used, two distinct, two distinct groups are in view. Matthew 21, 5 and 7, Matthew 27, 25, Luke 23, 28, Acts 2, 18, Acts 5.11, Acts 7.10, Romans 4.9, Hebrews 8.8, 8, Revelation 8.10, Revelation 10.5 and 8, Revelation 19.16, and Revelation 24. In every one of them, two groups are in view. And indeed, it's in dozens of uses in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament as well. Um, so I think that we should agree with Donald Campbell in his commentary on Galatians that the repetition of the preposition indicates that two groups, not the same group, are in view. Sixth and finally, Paul here alludes to the final benediction of, what's, of, of a Jewish um, blessing known as the Shemone Esra, which refers to two groups. Um, Peter Richardson helps explain why we know this. He says that elsewhere in Pauline prayers, blessings, and liturgical formula where coordinate or consecutive words are used, they are arranged logically. This is what he means. In Galatians 6.16, peace comes before mercy, even though logically mercy is what enables peace. But elsewhere, Paul does it in the right order. In Ephesians 1.2, it's grace first and then peace, because grace is what makes peace possible. And in fact, he inserts peace before, uh, mercy before peace in his letters to Timothy. That's the normative <clears throat> um, structure. So Richardson goes on to explain that there's no example of the two terms appearing in the reverse order. And that makes the one example which is close, the Shimona Esra, more impressive. You see, just as Paul uses peace before mercy in a sort of illogical, unexpected way, so the Shimone Eskra is the only one to do likewise. It has peace first and then mercy. But just as Paul speaks of two groups, them and the Israel of God, so the Shimone Eskra has us and all Israel, us being the local congregation and all Israel being the entire Jewish population. So just as the Shimona Esra has two groups in view, and that's to the, what, uh, that to which Paul is alluding, so we should uh, understand Paul to be doing the same in Galatians, as Richardson concludes, and as Ben Witherington concludes. Um, so I think that we should agree with Ernest DeWitt Burton, who says that this expression, Israel of God, applies not to the Christian community, but to Jews. Yet it's not just Israel full stop, it's Israel of God. Not, so it's therefore not a reference to the whole Jewish nation, but rather to pious Israel, uh, the remnant, or possibly the pious Israel that all of Israel will be in the eschaton if one understands Paul's all Israel shall be saved to be referring to a future restoration of Israel. Those are the two best understandings of the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16, either presently the Jewish believers in Christ or all Jewish believers in Christ, in, uh, including the all Israel that will be saved in the eschaton. Um, 
So, but just as a reminder, you can accept this case that I've made for the word Israel being preserved in the New Testament as a reference to Jewish, to, to either Jews worldwide or to Jewish believers. You can accept this case as strong as I think as I think it is, without having to embrace all other sorts of peculiarities about dispensationalism. And as I've already explained, indeed, I'm not a dispensationalist. So I'm hoping that that will sort of um, uh, let, allow you to let your guard down, you viewers who are worried that somehow you're going to have to be committed to dispensationalist and all of its peculiarities if you accept my case. Be at ease. You don't have to. You can accept what I'm saying here for the reasons that I offered at the beginning, that it's important, um, without becoming a full-fledged dispensationalist. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris, for that opening statement. And now we will move to Steve Gregg. And Steve Gregg has 20 minutes as well for his opening statement. And um, we'll get the PowerPoint set up here. You got it. And there it is. And so, Steve, uh, you go at it, brother, and I'll start the timer. Okay. Well, I appreciate Chris's presentation, and I agree with uh, probably most of it. I disagree with much of what the scholars say that he quoted, but I agree with most of his premise. That is that most of the time in the Bible, the word Israel, and even in the New Testament, it means Israel, the, the Jewish people. Of course, he mentioned how many times Israel and Jew are used in the New Testament. If we would eliminate the number of times those occur in the Gospels in the book of Acts, we would have a somewhat more clear picture. Because the Gospels, of course, are a narration that contrasts the Jews and Israel with the disciples of Jesus and even with Jesus himself, who happened to be a Jew, and so were his disciples, but often says the Jews said this and the Jews did that. So we know that the, uh, the writers of the Gospels of course, make the distinction that the Old Testament makes between Jews and Gentiles, and even between Jews and Jesus and the apostles sometimes. Um, but when we get to the theology of the, of the epistles, that's where I believe we begin to see some things more clearly, although Jesus makes allusions to some of these things. Uh, he, uh, Chris said that there's only, well, what, three uh, cases that the word Jew uh, or, uh, or Israel is used that could possibly allegedly be used of the church in only about four cases where the word Jew can be. So it may be those seven cases that we're going to be discussing here. Uh, I don't have any interest in denying that the word Israel is used a great deal in the Bible, Old and New Testament, to refer to the Jewish people and the Jewish nation and the Jewish race. No question about that. The question is whether Paul, especially, or Peter uh, and John, uh, ever suggest that the Gentiles who have been brought to the Jewish Messiah are now incorporated into Israel and belong to the Israel of God, uh, along with the Jewish believers. Uh, my contention would be that in the New Testament, the church is considered to be Jews and Gentiles who are the Israel of God. But let me uh, start out. I have three things I want to do in this little time I have. One is I want to talk about the meaning of the word Israel as we go through the scriptures. The second is I want to show that these uh, many of the titles given to Israel are applied to Christ as the true Israel, of which the nation of Israel was a type and a shadow. And then I want to talk about the terms, if I have time, uh, the titles for Israel that are applied to uh, the church. And some of this will be looking at some of the same scriptures that Chris has brought up, of course. But these are my, uh, this is my thesis here that I'd like to give, that uh, the term Israel is used in many ways in scripture, and uh, Yet, in some cases, it refers only to the remnant of Israel, and uh, that the cases where there's promises that make Israel special in terms of God's uh, purposes and destiny uh, primarily refer to this remnant, especially when it comes to New Testament time. Uh, so I agree with him that the Jewish believers are really the, the remnant of Israel. I just believe that once you incorporate uh, Gentiles, then there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles in this company. Uh, Israel was a type of Christ. So we're going to see that the titles that apply to Israel in the Bible also apply to Christ. And uh, then, of course, because we are in Christ, the body of Christ, the church, uh, shares Christ's identity and therefore is also referred to as Israel. Now, the meaning of Israel in the Old Testament, uh, I'm going to run through this as quickly as I can. It's used many ways. First of all, of course, it refers to a man, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. We see that in Genesis 32, 28. God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. So it was a man. It's an individual usage initially. Then it's used of a family where it begins to become racial. 
and is Jacob's family when he still only has 12 sons. And we see that, for example, in Genesis 34, 7. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field where they heard it, that is about Dinah's being raped, their sister. And the men were grieved and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. Now in Israel, there wasn't even a nation of Israel, it was just Jacob and his 12 sons and daughter. Uh, but we can see that in Israel means in the family of Israel. So it begins to take on a racial uh, meaning, even more so when it comes to the family becoming large enough to be 12 tribes. This is also a racial way of speaking of them. For example, uh, in Exodus 12, verse 3, God said, speak to all the congregation of Israel. Now, this is before they were made a nation. They were still in Egypt at this time, so they weren't a nation yet. But they're a big family, a very big family, a big race, uh, 3 million people, perhaps, some people say. So we have it used individually and as a small family and also as a large family. Exodus 14, 30, it says, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hands of the Egyptians. Again, this is before they were a nation. This is just a big family. It's a racial a designation for them. Then we have them as a nation, and this becomes a covenantal identification. Uh, there are people who are not racially Israel, but are in the nation of Israel, because the nation of Israel is based on a covenant. God said when he created the nation of Israel, in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 at Mount Sinai, he said, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were not yet a nation, but they were going to be if they agreed to these terms. He says, these are the words that Moses should speak to all the sons of Israel. So the basis for being this nation called Israel were to be obedient to God's voice and faithful to his covenant. So it becomes a covenantal thing. And we know it wasn't racial at this point because the group at Mount Sinai were not all Israelites. There was a mixed multitude there, as we see, that the... Uh, the, in Exodus 12, 38, it says that a mixed multitude left Egypt with them. A mixed multitude also went up with them, it says. So at Mount Sinai, there were Israelite, racially people, and some Gentiles. Who knows what races, but others who were not of their same race. Uh, it also says in the law that a proselyte, which is not a Jewish person, when he becomes a, uh, when he wants to be circumcised and so forth, can become just like a native of the land. That is no distinction between Jew or Gentile if he's circumcised. Exodus 12, 48 says, but if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near to celebrate it and he shall be like a native of the land as he'll be no distinction uh, t between himself and a an, an, uh, racial Israelite. So the nation had people like this. Of course, uh, Rahab and uh, Ruth were Gentiles who became Israelites although they didn't have to be circumcised for obvious reasons. But the point is, you could be a Gentile and be part of Israel under the covenant. You had to keep the covenant, though. You had to be circumcised. Also, a Jew who was a covenant breaker would be cut off from Israel. According to Exodus 12, 15, it says, whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now, there's many passages like this in the law. If you do this, if you worship idols, if you do this or that, you'll be cut off from Israel. Now, he's talking about Jews. So what we know then is that it was a mixed multitude, Jews and Gentiles that came out of Egypt. It, uh, a Gentile could become just like a Jew in it. Uh, of course, it's too early to be talking about Jews. We're talking about Israelites racially here. And a, a racial Israelite would be out of Israel, would not, if they if they did certain things, be cut off from Israel, which means Israel, as defined about Sinai, was a covenantal term, not a racial term, because there were Gentiles in it. Any Gentile could be part of it, and any Jew could be kicked out of it. What was the terms for being in it? If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. So Israel, the nation, is a covenantal, not racial designation. And that's true, of course, today as well in the new Israel. Now, also the word Israel is used in a geographical sense, as, as Chris mentioned. Uh, it sometimes refers to the land that the Israelites lived in, as, for example, in 1 Samuel 13, 19, it says no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel, or 1 Kings 1, 3. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, here we have the word being used in terms of a, a geographical uh, situation, the, the land that God gave them. Then there's a political designation when the two nations, uh, the one nation divides into two the northern kingdom versus the southern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom, 
and Israel became the name of the Northern Kingdom. So the, sometimes the word Israel is used to be a nation, a political entity, uh, distinct from Judah, another political entity. So we see 1 Kings 14, 14, and many other places in the Old Testament. Uh, moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who will cut off the house of Jeroboam. It's not talking about the Jews in Judah. It's talking about the Northern Kingdom. It's a political uh, distinction. And then, of course, we have the remnant, which is a spiritual slash covenantal designation. Um, now, if you just look at these things, you've got the name Israel can be a man, it can be a family, a large family, it can be a, a nation defined by covenant, not by race, it can be a land geographical, um, and it can be a, a political entity separate from other Israelites, namely the tribe of Judah. So we have a lot of different uses, but the remnant is the most important uh, way that Israel is used in the Old Testament, because it is a people who are in, as F.F. F. Bruce put it, they're the ones who are in fact, or in, in reality, what all Israel was supposed to be in theory. That is, they're the ones who really do keep the covenant. Most of the nation did not, but some did. These are people who have a spiritual nature that's toward God, who have their hearts circumcised, for example, as Chris was talking about, and, and Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and others talk about this. Um, in Micah chapter 2, verse 12, God said, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. Notice in the poetry and the, the parallelism here, all of you, Jacob, is referring to the remnant of Israel. It's not a reference to uh, the whole nation at all, but really the remnant of the nation, though it does say all of you, Jacob. Likewise, in Isaiah 46, 3, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. Now, I'm not really sure if Chris would suggest, since he says, and, uh, and makes two different groups, if he'd not recognize these are the same group. But I believe in the parallelism of the Hebrew Bible, we see the house of Israel is the same as the remnant of the house of Israel. Many things in the Old Testament are addressed to the remnant. In fact, only the remnant were given the promises that are fulfilled in the New Testament. This remnant called Israel is the promised remnant. In Psalm 50, verse 5, it says, gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. But later in the same chapter, it says in verse 16, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? Now, obviously, he's addressing Israelites in both cases, Jews who are godly and who keep covenant and Jews who are ungodly. And he says, you have no right to take my covenant in your mouth. He's not talking to Gentiles there in verse 16. Gentiles never did as a group tend to take God's covenant uh, into their mouth, but the Jews did. So we see in Psalm 50 a recognition of two groups within Israel. There's the faithful remnant, and then there's the apostate majority. In Isaiah 10, 21 through 22, which Paul quotes in Romans 9, he says, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Now, the term the mighty God is only found one other place in the Bible, and that's in the previous chapter of Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, uh, six and seven, it says that uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. So that's the only other occurrence of this expression, the Mighty God, in the Bible, and it's in the previous chapter. So it's obviously referring to Jesus. Jesus is the one referred to that they're coming to. And Paul quotes it as if that is what it means. So it says, for though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. So we can see that uh, again, salvation is only for the faithful remnant. Joel chapter 30, uh, Joel chapter 2, which is only a couple of verses after the passage that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost that was fulfilled there with the pouring out of the Spirit. He says, and it shall come to pass, in verse 32, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now, Peter quotes this in Acts chapter 2, of course, and he says, whoever, he, he, uh, he ends at saying, uh, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't read the rest of the passage, but he was familiar with it. Certainly, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and it's in Jerusalem and Mount Zion that there's deliverance, and that is among the remnant whom the Lord calls, which would be, as we shall see, Jews and Gentiles whom God calls. So we have these various ways of speaking about Israel. It can be racial, it can be covenantal, or something else. Now, I'm really running out of time. Israel's titles applied to Christ. In Isaiah, there are several passages called the 
servant of Yahweh passages. And uh, these sometimes refer to Israel, as in Isaiah 41, 8, where it says, but you, O Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of, my, of Abraham, my friend. And, but also there's several of them that talk about Jesus as the servant. Isaiah 42, 1 through, I'll just give, let's not do, read all of it. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This is quoted by Paul, um, Matthew in chapter 12 about Jesus' ministry. So the servant of Yahweh, which is a term for Israel in the Old Testament, is a reference to Christ, who is the fulfillment of the type. He is the antitype of Israel. Likewise, Yahweh's firstborn, originally is Israel. Exodus 4.22 says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. But Psalm 89, which is a messianic passage, verse 27, says, I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. This is actually quoted in the book of Revelation as being about Christ, the firstborn. Likewise, in Hebrews 1.6, it says, But when he again brings his the firstborn, into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So Israel is the firstborn, Christ is the firstborn. Abraham's seed, of course, is referred many times in the Bible to the uh, nation of Israel. Uh, for example, Isaiah 41, 8, but you, O Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. That's Abraham's seed, his descendants. However, Galatians 3, 16 says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, to your seed, which is Christ. So Paul says, references of promises made to Abraham and his seed are really made to Abraham and Christ. Israel was the type of Christ and was called the seed of Israel before Christ came, and he is the fulfillment of that. Likewise, the vine. In Isaiah chapter 5, uh, God said that he planted a vineyard on a choice hill. And he says in verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant, that is the vine in it. He looked for fruit from them. He didn't get it, as we know. But Jesus comes along and John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine. Now, there's no question that his Jewish listeners would know what the vine was. They are the vine. Israel is the vine. But he says, no, I am. I'm actually the true vine. And so he is the true Israel. These terms that applied to Israel before now apply to Jesus. And if to Jesus, then to the church. The titles uh, of Israel applied uh, to those who are in Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body uh, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now what he's saying here is the body of Christ is Christ embodied. As a, as a human body has many members, but they're all one body, so also is Christ. That is Christ is one body made up of many members. And so he's identifying the church with Christ, of course. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul says he put all things under his feet, gave them to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The body of Christ is the fullness of him, of Christ, says Paul. So the titles that apply to Christ also are applied to us. For example, in Galatians 3, 27 through 29, uh, Paul said, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, that is, we are in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, we already saw earlier that Abraham's seed is a term for Israel in the Old Testament and for Christ. And now for us, because we are his, we're in him. We are that one. We're not many. It's not many seeds, but one seed. But we are one in Christ, and therefore we are the seed. The circumcision, I don't have time to go into all the scriptures about this, but obviously Philippians 3.3, written largely to a Gentile church with very few Jews in it, said, we are the true circumcision. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And he didn't say, and also are physically circumcised. He's not talking to the Jews in the church. He's talking to the church. And we're all the circumcision, which is an expression by which the Jews were referred. And many times in the New Testament, the Jewish people were called the circumcision. But Paul says, yeah, but we're the the circumcision now. Jews inwardly. Uh, Chris made a good point about this. This could be understood to be about Jews who believe, except he says he is not a Jew who's one inwardly. Uh, I mean, he is a Jew who's one inwardly. A circumcision is that of the heart of the spirit, not the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. Truly, this applies to the remnant of Jews 
but it also applies to us whom Paul said to the Philippians, we are the circumcision. So if we're circumcised in the heart, we're the true circumcision and therefore the true Jews, which is what circumcision refers to. We are also a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God said that to Israel in Exodus 19.6. Peter said it to us in 1 Peter 2.9. But you, he means us, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Same terms he used to speak of Israel. They were, and we are. It is uh, also the olive tree. I'll have, to, I'll have to wait on that one. Chris brought something up about the olive tree. I'll have to save that for the rebuttal time because I'm out of time for, for what I want to present right now. I'd like to talk about that more, but we'll have to wait on that. Okay, so in summary, Israel is a term with a variety of meanings in the scripture. Titles that belong to the Old Testament Israel are applied in the New Testament to Christ, to whom Israel is a type. And those in Christ are his body and share in his identity, and so also share the titles that once belonged to the national Israel and now belong to Christ. And that's where I'm going to have to quit. Thank you, Steve Gregg, for those opening statements. And now we will turn it over to Chris Date for his 10-minute rebuttal. So, Chris, the timer is started, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Braxton, and thank you also, Steve, for an excellent opening presentation. You viewers will now understand why I was so nervous and, and justifiably, justifiably so. Um, however, I don't think that the case that Steve presented, compelling as it might seem on the surface, um, really is convincing. I don't think he's really substantiated the view that the church is rightly called Israel in any sense, or that Gentile Christians are in any sense rightly called Jews. And I'll explain why. Um, first of all, um, uh, Steve rightly noticed that the numbers I were giving um, were uh, about the number of uses of Jew in Israel were based on the entire New Testament, which includes the Gospels and Acts. And he suggests that if we remove those, um, then the number will be smaller. And that's true, um, but the ratio is still pretty stark. Um, in Romans alone, for example, there's at least... Uh, 10, 11 uses of the word, if not more than that, because in some places it's used multiple times in a single verse. Um, and leading all up to Romans 2, uh, 28 and 29, and afterwards, the many occurrences of Jew in that uh, text refer to Jews. Um, not Gentile believers. Um, outside, across all of the Pauline epistles, there are 26 uses of Jew, and we're being told that we should believe that two of those 26 refer to Gentile um, Christians. I think that's unlikely. Um, and then there's, of course, two more uses in the book of Revelation. So as far as I can tell, we're still dealing with at least 28 uses of the word, only two of which are here being alleged to um, refer to Gentile Christians. That still seems to me to be unlikely, and it would make more sense uh, to understand those uses of Jew as being in a way that is consistent with uh, the use, the, all the other uses of the word Jew in Romans and outside of Romans in the other epistles. Um, similarly, with the word Israel, Israel appears 17 times in the Pauline epistles uh, and um, three times in Revelation and another three times in Hebrews. So that's three, six, uh, 17, 23 uses of Israel, only one of which, so far as I can tell, um, is alleged to be a reference to the church. That still seems to me to be a, um, a stark uh, a, a, a problematic ratio for Steve's position. Um, in his enumeration of the various ways in which the word uh, Israel is used in the Old Testament, um, I don't disagree with much of what he said, um, but it is worth noting that the nation that was identified as Israel, that, that designation was not covenantal in the sense of it being any covenant at all. It was a specific covenant, the covenant made with Israel. And while that mixed multitude, while there was a mixed multitude there at Sinai, the nation then and, uh, and, and for the rest of Old Testament history was extremely dominated by Jews. And so it would make sense to call that nation Israel, even if there were some Gentile converts among them. And even if it's true, and I'm not necessarily conceding that it is, that, gen that, that Gentile proselytes or converts to Judaism um, even if it's true that they were considered Israel, and again, I'm not necessarily conceding that point, um, the New Testament nevertheless uh, consistently um, differentiates between uh, proselytes and Jews. So, for example, in um, Matthew 23, 15, I think it is. I'll pull that one up uh, just to make sure I'm right. I, I don't think that bell is about my time, right, Braxton? No. Okay, <laughs> just making no, sure. No. Um, 
So the Jews are said to cross uh, across a sea um, and land to make a single proselyte, um, but that's not even the best example of what I'm trying to pull up. Um, a better example would be, um, let's see here, Acts 2.10, I think, is another example. So in Acts 2.10, there's this list of Jews from a variety of um, places, and then it says in verse 11 of Acts 2, both Jews and proselytes. And there are other places in the New Testament where Jews and proselytes are differentiated as well. So even if the Old Testament in some sense includes proselytes in, under the identity of Israel, that doesn't mean that the New Testament substantiates doing so. And as for covenant breakers being cut off, yeah, I agree, except that I think, if I'm not mistaken, that cut off doesn't merely mean kicked out, to use the language that Steve used um, as, as a paraphrase for cut off. To be cut off from the house of Israel means to be killed. Now, as for the land uh, uh, making being called Israel and therefore suggesting that it can be a geographical um, indication, that's true, but that's because it's the land that was associated with Israel because God promised it to them. Um, and, and so the fact that the land could be called Israel doesn't seem to suggest that it's so flexible as to include Gentiles of some notion. Um, so let's see here. In... So uh, Steve mentioned that in Isaiah 46, 3, there's a parallelism where it says the house of Jacob and, uh, and the house of Israel or, or something like that. And he was, uh, but yet clearly referring to all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, that's true. That's, an, that's a Hebraic parallelism. And, and that, can actually, that can absolutely stand. But Galatians 6, 16, upon them and the Israel of God, there's no parallelism there, just as there's no parallelism in the um, Amidah or the Shimoneh Esra that Paul alludes to. Um, when when they say peace and mercy be upon us and upon all Israel, they're not, they're, it's not a parallelism. They're talking about the local congregation, and then they're talking about the rest of Israel, uh, as um, any commentator who recognizes the connection to the Shomen, Shimone Esra will, um, will identify. Um, he, Steve said that it's only the remnant that have been given the promises, and that's true. Um, and yet, Paul says that it is Israel, the Jewish remnant of Israel, to whom the promises were indeed made. So in Romans 9, when Paul expresses his great sorrow and anguish because he would be willing to be cut off from Christ for the sake of his brothers, he says, they are the Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. And then he goes on to say, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So yes, the promises are to Israel, but the Israel he's talking about is not the church. It's referring to the subset of Israel that is the remnant. Again, he's using he's doing that Midrashic interpretation of the Old Testament texts that talk about the remnant to identify a subset of Israel that is genuinely the, the uh, that is genuinely Israel. Um, so I don't see anything particularly important there. And, and I'll just add that again, I'm not suggesting that um, in or I'm not arguing in this debate that the promises made to Israel aren't in fact made to the church or extend to the church. I'm not arguing that here. So I, I see that as as irrelevant apart from what I've already commented on it. Now, turning to the issue of Christ, Steve is absolutely right. Israel is a type of Christ. But the fact that there's an antitype does not mean that, that when, when the antitype appears, it doesn't mean that the type doesn't exist or that the, or that the meaning of the type has become utterly irrelevant. Um, you've, got, you've got Israel, the nation, and then you've got the antitype, the, the typological fulfillment of Israel is Christ. That doesn't mean that Israel doesn't still properly designate the original type. Uh, moreover, in Galatians 3.16 uh, and, and elsewhere, when Paul does creative things, he's exercising midrash, like, like when, when he says that Abraham, uh, the promises were made to Abraham and his seed, singular, not plural. Um, people like Michael Brown and many others will tell you that this, this midrashic exegesis that um, Paul is doing, is this not mean that there was indeed only uh, Christ in view in that original text. Um, the the midrashic the the, the uh, midrashic Jewish interpretation um, was not one that acknowledged there was one and only one meaning to any given text. It was one that acknowledged that there were layers of meaning that midrash could unravel, unveil. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that the original meaning was it was indeed promised to the seed, which in the Hebrew could refer could could be a plurality or a singularity. And and Paul is just just flexibly showing how it can apply to either one. And despite the fact that Christians are indeed in Christ, Gentiles are never 
clearly referred to as Jews in the New Testament, and the church is never clearly referred to as Israel. How interesting it is that if Gentiles being in Christ means that it's legitimate to call Gentile Christians Jews and the church Israel, how interesting it is that we have absolutely no clear uh, uh, references as such in the New Testament, only extremely hotly disputed ones for which a great deal of evidence suggests um, they are not references to the church or to Gentile Christians. Galatians 3, 27 to 29 does indeed say that uh, Christ, Gentile Christians are heirs of Abraham. Uh, other places, uh, Paul does the same thing. But Israel was never identified merely as the descendants of Abraham. Uh, Israel were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the first man named Israel. So the fact that uh, Gentile Christians can be considered sons of Abraham, like those sons of Abraham that Jesus said he could raise up from the stones. Notice he didn't say, I can raise up Israelites from the stones. He didn't say, I could raise up Israel from the stones. He said, I can, I can raise up sons of Abraham from these stones. And so likewise, Gentile Christians are sons of Abraham, but that doesn't make them Jews. It doesn't make the church Israel. Neither does circumcision of the heart make one automatically Israel. Um, when Paul says that um, circumcision of the heart is what matters and that that's the kind of circumcision that uh, the remnant of Jews has experienced, that doesn't automatically follow that anybody who is so circumcised by the heart is a Jew. All of the Old Testament and intertestamental passages to which Paul alludes with his circumcision of the heart language are still talking about a faithful remnant within Israel and not um, Gentiles outside of Israel joining it. Uh, and in Philippians 3, 3, we are the true circumcision. It's worth noting as well that there's a dispute over whether or not Paul is actually talking about um, we, the church. He may indeed be referring to he and his fellow Jewish apostles. Um, that's all the time I've got, so I'll stop there. Oh my goodness, with three seconds to spare. All right, well, um, Thank you for that. And Steve, Greg, you now have 10 minutes for your first rebuttal. Okay. Uh, well, I don't, I, I don't dispute with Chris that it's a very seldom uh, occurrence in the New Testament to use the word Israel or Jew to speak about a Christian or the church. What I'm saying, though, is that the concept of Israel and the concept of a Jew is often woven into Paul's argument so that we do find, as I pointed out, the church is referred to as Abraham's seed, uh, not just heirs, but Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So whatever heirs the promise applied to, uh, the church is them. Anyone who is Christ's is Abraham's seed. I'm calling us the, the circumcision. Um, I do believe that Philippians 3.3 uh, in the context would not be a reference to Paul and his fellow Jewish Believers. I don't know how that would serve the purpose of anything he's trying to tell the Philippians if he's trying to distinguish between him and them, uh, that is, the Jews and the Gentiles. I don't think Paul did much of that in any of his writings. Uh, I don't think he tried to distance himself from his Gentile readers in terms of identity. Um, uh, it seems obvious that he says those who are uh, true circumcision are those who rejoice in Christ Jesus, who are, uh, worship God in the spirit and put no confidence in the flesh. True, Jewish Christians don't do that. But Gentile Christians don't either, and that's what he's identifying as circumcision. Remember, he wrote to the Colossians in chapter 2 and said that they have been circumcised with the circumcision not made by hands by the circumcision of Christ. So clearly Paul was referring to Gentiles. Colossians were Gentiles uh, when he talked about us being circumcised uh, the, uh, without hands. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not really interested in fighting over the word uh, he is a Jew who's one inwardly. Uh, I'm not even interested in whether Paul ever called Christians Jews or even whether they call them Israel. It's enough that he called them the descendants and heirs of Abraham's blessing, that he called us the true circumcision, that he referred to us as, or Peter referred to us as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which was a term that was used of Israel when he made his covenant Mount Sinai. And you mentioned, you said that, you know, the covenant Mount Sinai, that was only made to Israelites, even though maybe some Gentiles were there. Well, no, it was made to uh, all those who would keep his covenant, and, and we, we could say it was the covenant made at Sinai was made with everyone there on the condition that they would keep his covenant, in which case they would be part of that holy nation and that kingdom of priests. Now, I, I wouldn't dispute for a moment that the, the nation of Israel was predominantly dominated by Jewish people. It was a, probably a relatively rare thing for Gentiles to become proselytes. For one thing, it was painful, and I don't know how many of them were motivated at all to become Jews, but some did. We know that some did. And therefore, what we can say is the nation of Israel was biracial uh, or multiracial. It was a multiracial uh, entity. It still is. You see, Israel is identified as those who are obedient to the covenant. Now, when Jeremiah said 
that God was going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This was a, applied to the remnant, of course, because the remnant met with Jesus in the upper room. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. So he's saying, I'm establishing the new covenant with you. Now, by the way, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, who were not Jews, in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, he said that uh, the law was written on their hearts and so forth. That he was, obviously, he's applying Jeremiah 31 to, to their situation. He says, not on tables of stone, but on the fleshy tablets of the heart, uh, the covenants made with them. So Gentile Christians in Corinth, um, the disciples in the upper room who were Jewish remnant, uh, they had the new covenant, and so do we. And so as Old Testament Israel was defined by faithfulness to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, New Covenant Israel is defined by obedience to the New Covenant. And yes, it was originally Jews. It is true the 144,000 are Jews. They were the first Christians. They were the first fruits to God, it says in Revelation 14, uh, because that's true. The Jewish people were preached to first, but then Gentiles were added to them, an innumerable company of them, as represented in Revelation 7 also. But what were they added to? Uh, if we don't say that they were added to Israel, to the true Israel, I mean, to the remnant of Israel, then we're going to have to have two distinct bodies that are saved, the saved Jews and the saved Gentiles. Now, that's exactly what Paul's saying is not the case in Galatians chapter 3, where he says there's no Jew or Gentile. You're right. There are differences uh, ethnically between Jews and Gentiles. There's difference uh, gender-wise between men and women. There's economic differences between slaves and free. Paul's not ruling out all differences, but he's ruling out any important differences. He's saying when it comes to identity, we're all one in Christ, and we are Abraham's seed and heirs of our new promise. Now, he doesn't use the word Jew, he doesn't use Israel. Like I said, I wouldn't care if he never used it. Uh, the, it's the concept, not the verbiage, that, that, it, that we're trying to grasp here. The idea is that the faithful remnant of Israel came to Christ, and they, and they still do, by the way. There are still Jews who come to Christ today, and they become the true Israel. And so do the Gentiles who are grafted in among them. Now, the olive tree is not a picture of just God's people, although we could say that. It's an image of Israel because Jeremiah 11:16 uses exactly the same words that Paul uses in Romans 11. When he, in uh, Jeremiah 11:16, God says to Israel, "You are called the green olive tree, and uh, you were set on fire, and some branches have been broken off." Well, Paul talks about the olive tree, and any Jew would recognize that that's referring to Israel. And some Jews have been broken off. Why? Because of unbelief. Okay, so they're not part of Israel anymore. Uh, Gentiles have been grafted in. So they are part of Israel. They're part of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. And so Paul says, and in this way, all Israel is saved, meaning the whole olive tree, the Jewish and the Gentile ones. You see, right after he talks about the olive tree, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant that, uh, you know, hardness in heart has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. That is, by eliminating the dead branches of the Jews who didn't believe and by adding the Gentile branches that do, in this way, all the true Israel is, in fact, saved. And there's one place where Paul truly does use the word uh, Israel. Now, we know he's using the word Israel to mean the church because he doesn't believe all national Israel or racial Israel will be saved. In fact, two chapters earlier in Romans 9, 27, he quotes Isaiah 10, where he said, only a remnant of Israel will be saved. So though the children of Israel be as the sand of the seashore, only the remnant will be saved. So in the same discussion, he says, only a remnant of the Jews are going to be saved but all the true Israel will be saved by when the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. That is, in, he says, thus, or in this way, all Israel will be saved. It's obvious from the olive tree illustration that the olive tree is made up of Jews until the unbelieving Jews are removed, and then Gentiles are added in by faith. That's the same entity we call the body of Christ. It's the same entity Jesus referred to as the true vine himself, of which we are branches. So this is the way that Paul talks. This is the way Jesus talks, actually. And it's the way the New Testament teaches, that there's no distinction between a believing Jew and a believing Gentile in terms of identity. And if someone wants to make that distinction, they're building up a wall of partition that God broke down and making themselves an offender. Paul said, if I build again that which I once destroyed, I make myself an offender. The Israel of God, by the way, is either the same or contrasted with those who, you know, keep this rule that Paul talked about in Galatians 6.16. But if it's contrasted, then he's saying the Israel of God don't keep that rule. He's saying to all who do peace and 
also on the Israel of God if there's somebody else. So if there's somebody else, then those who keep the rules, then there are people who don't keep the rule. They don't fit the description if there's somebody else. But if they're the same ones, that makes sense. Even when you use the Shimon Ezra, you gave a quote from it that said, um, us and all Israel. And you said, this is a parallel to what Paul said, and us means the local congregation of Jews, and all Israel the whole. Well, why couldn't Galatians 6.16 mean that? You in the, in the congregation were keeping these rules, and all the Israel of God, or even all the Israel of God, either way, they keep the rule too, but they're elsewhere than here. And so exactly the way that the uh, Shimon Ezra used the expression is the way that Paul could be using it easily. So I don't really see any, I don't see any objection. If, if Paul can talk to the, the church as the seed of Abraham and heirs of the promise, and as the circumcision, the true circumcision, and we can be called a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, which was the title given to Israel, then I don't really see why anyone would object to adding to that list the term, the olive tree, Israel, Jew. These are all synonyms in the Old Testament. And uh, so, I mean, if, if the word Israel or Jew is not frequently used to speak of Christians because of the confusion it would cause, no doubt, because Paul does speak about a distinction between Jews and Gentiles throughout Romans. He talks to the Jewish reader, he talks to the Gentile reader. But when he says all Israel will be saved, he's including the Jew and the Gentile. In the very passage he says it, he, he indicates it, gives the illustration of the olive tree, which includes Jews and Gentiles. And then he says, hardness has happened to the Jews so that Gentiles can come in and in this way, all Israel will be saved. I conclude. All right, thank you, Steve, and uh, appreciate that. And what we'll do now is we'll move to the fun part of the debate, which is more like a discussion, although it is a little bit organized. We're going to move to the cross-examination period. And during the cross-examination period, we are going to um, first have Steve cross-examine Chris. Um, you might see a little bit of the disturbance in the, as I'm trying to fix, fix up the video as it, uh, for the two of them to discuss side by side. So just ignore that. This is, after all, the first time we've ever done a debate on Trinity Radio. But I think you all can see that um, we're hopefully setting a precedent here for having excellent debaters on Trinity Radio. So um, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Steve to ask Chris whatever questions he'd like to ask and cross-examine him. Okay. Um, first of all, Chris, uh, you are right when in the Old Testament law it says shall be cut off that this usually refers to death. Um, it usually refers to execution. But I don't think it does in every case. The, the example I gave was of somebody who eats um, leaven during the seven days of unleavened bread, which is a minor infraction, for example, compared to David eating the showbread, which no one but the priests were allowed to eat. Uh, laws about eating are not usually death penalty laws. Usually only moral laws are death penalty laws, and that would include obviously murder and kidnapping and adultery and things like that. But I suspect that it would be excommunication in cases like like uh, eating leaven. That's my suspicion. Do you? Uh, would you insist that uh, everything uh, of the many things that uh, the Old Testament says will cut, get someone cut off from Israel always are death penalty issues? I wouldn't say that I would insist it. That is what I. That is my suspicion. Um, and in the example you gave, it's not just any dietary law that was violated. It was a law specifically having to do, if I'm not mistaken, um, with the Passover, mm -hmm. right? When um, the, the unleavened bread the, the, that was part of the Passover ceremony originally, in which um, the Jewish people, if they, um, ate, you know, celebrated the Passover in the right way or whatever, they they would um, be passed over by the uh, angel of death and so forth. Um, but if they failed to do that, and the text doesn't record anyone having failed to do it, but if they did, they would be among those whose firstborn were killed. So I, I would say that that example does not, to me, sound as like such a minor infraction that it wouldn't merit the death penalty. But but as for any particular usage of that phrase cut off, I, I'd want to look at it in its particular context. And if you want to take time during cross-examination to do that, we can. It's up to you. Fair enough. And would you agree that if they were cut off in the sense of put to death, that they were indeed eliminated from Israel? Well, they were eliminated full stop. I mean, you don't have a—somebody who is, who is dead and gone isn't anything, let alone a Jew. So well, the fact that them being cut off um, from the house of Israel means they're not part of Israel anymore, that, that's right, because they're not part of anything. They're gone. 
Well, the thing is that if a Jew, a faithful Jew died faithfully of natural causes, I think he'd still be regarded as on the rolls of Israel, but he wouldn't be cut off from the whole identification of Israel. I think that somebody who was excommunicated and killed, whether they were killed or not actually, but even if they were killed, would still be considered to be cut off from the promises and the, the identity of the nation of Israel. But maybe you and I don't agree about that. We don't have to, I suppose. Do, do you want me to follow up on that or do you want to move on to another question? Help yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think you're right. I don't think that a Jew, who, a faithful Jew who dies is similarly cut off from the nation of Israel. But Jesus says, for example, when he's talking with the Sadducees, he who denied the, the resurrection because uh, you know they didn't believe in an afterlife. So they were sad. You see, that's that joke everybody says makes me want to vomit every time I hear it. But anyway, he, in that conversation with the Sadducees, in order to prove the resurrection, he says, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's also the God of the living. And he, he uses that to prove that they will one day live again. So similarly, I think you can speak of dead faithful Jews as still part of Israel because one day they will rise and be part of the people of God, which includes the remnant of Israel. But somebody who's been caught off for violating the covenant may very well not be resurrected as part of the faithful uh, people of God and may in fact die again um, in the second death. So I, I still don't see the cut off being a reference to the death penalty as um, therefore requiring that even faithful Jews who don't die because of the death penalty are similarly cut off. Are, are you saying that if somebody is uh, resurrected from the dead and annihilated, that they have not been cut off from all the promises God had intended for Israel? I mean, Israel, faithful Israel, comes into the promises. Uh, those who are cut off do not. So I'd say they were cut off from Israel in a very significant sense. No, that's exactly my point. They are cut off from Israel in a very significant sense because when they rise, they will be subsequently killed. But the faithful Israelites who die, when they rise, they will still be a part of that faithful remnant. And as such, they are not cut off. That's what I was trying to say. I apologize for the confusion. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe, as I said, that what we're seeing is that God identifies who's, who's included in Israel by those who obey his voice and keep his covenant. That's the condition for being in and he allows Gentiles in. And, uh, you know, proselytes in, uh, on the day of uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter two were there along with Jews. Uh, and I, I don't really know that that's saying that they wouldn't be regarded as part of Israel just because we talk about them differently. I mean, we can talk about Israel and Judah as separate or as we can talk about them all as part of Israel. There's, uh, that's, I don't think the, the argument you made there is sufficiently relevant, but I am curious about uh, your suggestion that when a type has been fulfilled, it doesn't just go away. Uh, now you're referring to the fact that we both agree that Israel is a type of Christ. Now I believe that when a type is fulfilled, it, it becomes insignificant. It's true, uh, festivals and holy days and Sabbaths and, uh, dietary laws, they still exist among Jews today, but they were a shadow and they're done. They're, they don't exist as far as God is concerned. They're part of a non-Christian religion, actually, uh, an anti-Christian religion, since Judaism is anti-Christ, um, officially. Um, so can you think of any other type of Christ or of, any, of anything in, in the New Testament, any Old Testament type, that continues to have any validity or significance after the antitype has come, besides what you're suggesting? Well, I didn't suggest that there's any significance uh, to the term Israel still, in, in depending on what you mean by significance there. All I've suggested is that its referent remains unchanged. Um, so, for example, it, it very well could be, as I said at the very beginning of my opening presentation, that if I'm right and if Israel still is properly speaking a reference only to Jewish people, it doesn't follow that, therefore, they ha all the significance that once was associated with that word persists today. Um, as for the, the feasts and the Mosaic Covenant, and other, you know, similar things that passed away when the antitype came, those were explicitly stated as such. Um, it, it was explicitly stated that um, that the new covenant, or, or at the very least, it was implied, right? The, the the author of Hebrews, I think it is, says that because it said there was a new covenant, that implies that the old one um, is, is passing away. But you don't have similar language, so far as I'm aware, anyway, when it comes to Israel. In fact, if I remember correctly, it's in Isaiah or Jeremiah that God says, but until the heavens and earth pass away, um, I will still um, you know, Israel will still exist. So you've got exactly the opposite language, it seems to me, suggesting that Israel will exist 
indefinitely, even after the antitype comes. Yeah. Well, Jeremiah said in that passage that, uh, you know, if he, if God allows the heavens and or the moon and the stars and these ordinances to pass away, then he will also forsake all of the of the house of Israel so that none of them remain. Uh, I don't know anyone who believes that there are no Jews remaining, uh, and even some remain in the church, but they are Christians where there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. I'd be interested in knowing, just because you do think there's still a significant distinction between Jews and Gentiles, what that significance is. Well, I actually didn't say that I you, am arguing that there's a significant difference. When you talk about Galatians, you said there's a difference between males and females. Uh, and so there's definitely Jews and Gentiles. What is that difference? Between Jew and Gentile? In Christ. Uh -huh. In Christ? Uh, well, for one thing, it could, you know, um, uh, what does Paul say at the beginning of, of um, Romans 9 and, and elsewhere? He, he has a list of things that are uh, for Israel. Um, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. The giving of the law is something that applies to them, but presumably doesn't apply to um, Gentiles. Uh, and, and elsewhere, he enumerates things that are, I think it was early in Romans, he, he talks about significances of, um, and, and in fact, if I remember correctly, he explicitly says uh, at the very beginning of Romans 3, then what advantage has the Jew? Much in every way. So um, it reason. seems to me, mm -hmm. what's that? Yeah, it was principally that they were given the oracles of God. So right. he's, the Jews have had advantages Gentiles haven't had. He's talking historically, of course. He's not talking about now. Well, I, uh, of course he's not talking about now, but but I do think that there's truth to the notion that, or I think it's at least feasible that the um, that certain elements of Israeli culture, of Jewish culture, um, have been preserved through the past 2,000 years, such that um, just as Paul says in Romans 11, it's more natural for Jews to be grafted back into that tree. Now, and, now maybe you think that that was true maybe. then, but not now. Um, oh, but yeah. I see no reason. Huh? True. I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't hear you. What, what he said, if they do not remain in unbelief, they can be grafted in. Everyone I agree. Believes, don't they? But, but he, does, but he said, doesn't only say they can be grafted back in, he says how much more so, right? What, he says... He says if, if they do not remain in unbelief, yeah. Yeah, but, but if they do not remain in belief, how much more easily will they be grafted back in? The point being that if Jews believe, even today, they will more naturally be grafted back into the tree than Gentiles. And, and it seems to me tree? that... What is that tree? What will they be then? A part of the people of God. Part they of will Israel. still be Israel. Will they be part of Israel? Yeah. Part of the Israel of God? Yes, shame, because, because shame they're Jews. Gentiles are in that tree. The tree already has Gentiles in it and Jews. So they'll but get I, into the Israel of God then. But I didn't Guys, let me interrupt that, for just a moment and say that we are at the 10-minute mark. So how about go ahead and finish up maybe just... 20 more seconds on that point, and then we'll flip over to Chris's quick time. I'll let you have those seconds, Chris. Go ahead. All right, thanks. No, I, I was just saying that um, I haven't conceded to you that the Israel of God is synonymous with um, the tree or that the tree is synonymous with Israel. Um, so the fact that Jews can be grafted back into it and become part of the remnant, the true Israel, does not mean that if Gentiles are grafted in, they are also part of the true Israel. That would have to be. That would only be. That you'd have to substantiate first that it, they are indeed synonymous, the Israel and the olive tree, and I don't think that they are. All right. Um, I know that sometimes these debate situations. Both of you all are so familiar with debates. I wish I had um, as many debates under my belt as you both do. Uh, I know that it can be frustrating when we're just getting to maybe the crux of an issue and the time runs out. But uh, we're going to move now to Chris's time to cross-examine Steve. And so, Chris, uh, you feel free to begin that period. All right, thanks. Um, so, Steve, my, my first question for you is, when is the earliest um, post-New Testament Christian writer uh, that identifies the church with Israel? Uh, I, I don't know, and I don't really care. Uh, Post-New Testament, I, I don't agree with the church fathers on a lot of things, but I do know that even a dispensational student who wrote his master's thesis on the uh, theology of the uh, early church fathers before Justin Martyr said that they did not tend to identify, or they did tend to identify the church with Israel. I don't know which ones and what passages, but you see, I mean, you you quote a lot of uh, theolo or theologians and commentators and things like that, and and we, we could quote church fathers too. But when it comes down to, it, I want to know what the apostles said, and that's why I'm comparing them with Scripture. I take what Paul said and I compare it with the Old Testament passage he's alluding to, and. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware that there's a lot of theologians who see things differently, although there's a great number on, on this side, too. In fact, the church throughout most of history 
uh, held a view like mine, but that's, that doesn't make it right. I, I agree. I'm concerned. I think you'll find a uh, probably equal number of scholars on both sides of this issue. The question is not what did the scholars say or how many can we quote. The question is what does Paul mean? What does Jesus mm -hmm. when they allude to Old Testament passages? Yeah, no, I agree with you, Stephen. And, and and just as a heads as a heads up, I might if I cut you off during this time, it's only because I'm running out of time to ask my questions, and I want to make sure to be able to get through as many as I can. Um, my point was not that whenever this idea first arises, if it's late, that it therefore means it's wrong. But I do think it's noteworthy that the first time any Christian clearly refers to the Church as Israel is in 160 A.D. with Justin Martyr. Prior to that point, in all of Clement of Rome, uh, all of his epistle in uh, um, uh, Ignatius of Antioch's epistles in the Epistle of Barnabas, Israel and the uh, and the Israelites are consistently 100% of the time referred to as the Jewish people. Now that doesn't win the debate, um, but I just I, I was just no, curious. I um, as far as I'm concerned, Paul only used the word Israel for the Church one time. But that's right, not, no, I understand. Maybe twice. I, no, I get it. I understand. Um, so the next question I want to ask you is, which which of Paul's epistles do you uh, do you think were the earliest that he wrote? I believe Galatians was first, first and second Thessalonians next. Then you're going to have the Corinthian epistles and Romans, and then there's right, right. prison epistles. Yeah. Do, do you do you find it? Do you not find it as strange as I do that in his very first letter, plausibly, um, he uses the Israel of God phrase and imbues it and, and refer and uses it to refer to the church, and then never uses that phrase again in any of his other epistles. Um, and when he does use the word Israel, he rarely, if ever, uses it to refer to the church. Does it not seem strange to you at all? No, not even a little bit. Paul doesn't have to okay. use the same phrase when there's many synonyms. For example, in Galatians 3, he said that the church— I know. You, you talked about the synonyms in, in, your, in your opening statement. Right. 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 And so since okay. he calls the church the Abraham, uh, Abraham's seed, it'd be very strange if he distinguished them from the Israel of God a few chapters later. Mm -hmm. do, do you, do you, well, it's, I, I actually explained why it's not odd, but it's not um, my time to make statements. It's my time to ask questions. So, uh, but I'll encourage listeners to rewatch my opening statement where I demonstrated why it wasn't odd at all that he distinguished between Jews and Gentiles in his final clothing, closing. But, but I do want to ask you about that. So um, given how objectionable it would have been to Jewish people, for, uh, or maybe you would dispute that it was this objectionable, I'll be interested in how you answer this, given how objectionable it seems like it would be to um, refer to the Israel of God in, in, in such a way, um, do you, does it not strike you that there's a risk there that by referring to the whole church as the Israel of God, it might actually um, f exacerbate the division between Jew and Gentile in the church rather than unite as he was so trying to do? I don't think so. I think that would mean they're one entity, as he told them in chapter three, you're one in Christ, one body in Christ, and that's the Israel of God. Now, if Jews in the church are offended, that's their problem. I don't think Paul spent much time worrying about how many Jews he offended. I think he offended Jews everywhere he went. I think he wanted to tell the truth, and I think he told it. I don't think he cared who was offended. What about what about Jewish Christians today who are offended by the notion that the Israel of God is a reference to the church? Do you think that they— um, Shame I on mean, them. Why should well, they? Okay, fine, but 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 again, that? but but again, the question is, whatever their reasons, uh, shame on them, as you say, uh, yeah. for for finding it objectionable. Why do you think Paul would use such an objectionable phrase, such an objectionable uh, objectionable idiom, uh, in the benediction for crying out loud at the cl at, after having talked at length about justification by faith? Um, it, he, it is very closing. He actually exacerbates the division. Do you think yeah. that would be a little counterproductive? He didn't write a letter to Jewish readers. He wrote to Gentile readers who were being Judaized. And uh, he was informing them, they're the true Israel. They don't have to worry about being circumcised to become Israel by in terms of the Judaizers. If, if Paul wrote a letter to Jews to evangelize them, he might avoid those kind of uh, statements. But he's writing to a Gentile audience who's Christians, not Jews. So he's not taking any chances there. So, okay, so there weren't any Jews in the church in Galatia? Well, if they were, they were. Oh, they had to exactly. share. We all agree. They had to share. Okay. We know it was a Gentile group because he was telling them not to get circumcised. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Um, you said that the allusion, Paul's allusion to the Shimona Esra, um, uh, actually might substantiate that Israel of God is referenced to the whole church because in the Shimona Esra, it's first a smaller group and then a larger group, all Israel. Um, I could, I would, I would agree that that's plausible except for something. Um, in the original, I mean, in the, in the Shimona Esra, us um, is a 
a definite group, I mean, a, a, a small group, and then it's all Israel. So there's that language of everybody. But in the Galatians passage, the all is actually in the first clause. It's all, who, you know, whoever walks by this rule. And then it's actually a, it's not just all Israel at the end, it's actually a subset, if I'm right, of uh, Israel, namely the Israel of God. So so it's it's still preserving the differentiation between the fullness and, and or the, the two distinct groups. Um, but the all doesn't the, the, his flipping the order of which is all does it does it seem to you that that um, challenges the notion that um, uh, that that he what am I trying to say here let, let me put the question this way um, if what evidence do you have for thinking that all who follow this rule is actually not all who follow this rule it's actually specifically those in Galatia. Because that, it sounded to me like that was what you were suggesting was how I'm, the, the that, allusion to the Shimon and Esker so. makes sense. What I'm saying is that those who follow this rule cannot be distinguished from the Israel of God without making the Israel of God be a people who don't follow that rule. Okay, I, let's let's talk about that for a second. Um, in Acts 5.11, um, we have that same epi chi epi structure. Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Wouldn't you agree that all who heard of these things includes the whole church? No, I think it refers to the unbelievers. I think the whole church was the church, and those who heard of these things were the unbelievers. But didn't the church hear of these things? Well, sure. Okay, so clearly then, um, you can have an all in one passage, a, an expansive group that um, some of the previous group would be a part of um, solely by that reference all or whoever, right? So, which which makes my point. Yeah. The, I those, think it actually makes mine. Those Namely, this, those who walk by this rule can include the Israel of God or could be the same. Yeah. No, no, no. Your point, just to be clear, was that the fact that it says whoever walks by this rule means that the Israel of God there, um, if it's a distinct group, can't be the the same uh, the, um, uh, people who walk by that rule. And yet here we have a parallel to that in Acts 5.11, where you've got two distinct groups, and yet one of those group is it meets the qualification of the second group, namely heard of these things. So what do you make of that? I'm, I'm not seeing that as a valid point. I believe that there's two groups intended in Acts chapter 5. There's the whole church, and then there's everyone who's outside the church. And true, uh, all who heard of these things uh, would include the church, but he's that's talking exactly about a group point. of people there. Yeah. But, right. So that's exactly my point. If I'm right, and if the Israel of God is a distinct group from all who follow this rule, then we have the exact parallel. And, if, and so your, your argument, what I'm trying to argue is your argument that if, if there are two distinct groups, it would mean the second group doesn't meet the qualification described in the first. That argument vanishes because of Acts 5.11, if not a number of other similar passages, right? Since Paul said that all Jews and Gentiles are one body in Christ, if they're in Christ, what is the value of dividing the church into two groups in his benediction? What, what is the value of that? I, okay, I'm glad you asked me, although technically it's my time to ask questions right now, but I'm happy to answer it um, because I explained in the opening what the point was. He has just spent a long time um, uh, admonishing Jews and speaking very negatively about apostate Jews. It makes perfect sense, as the scholars I quoted explained, that in his closing benediction, he would say, I'm not talking about all Jews. I'm talking about unbelieving Jews. Those Jews among you, Galatians, who are faithful, they are the Israel of God. And, and by the way, a similar thing would apply in Philippians 3. Three. There's a reason why Paul would distinguish himself and, the, and his apostles from Israel, uh, from the rest of Israel, because um, uh, it, it, he's saying, don't listen to the dogs, don't listen to the false Israel, listen to the true Israel, me and the apostles, which is only one pos possible way of reading Philippians 3.3. 3. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, to answer your question, it seems to me that my reading is actually what preserves the unity that Paul is trying to um, strive for there, uh, whereas I think your view actually exacerbates the division. But I, I want to give you a chance to have a final word because um, that wasn't a question, it was a statement, and that's a poor use of my time. No. Uh, well, I, I think the opposite is true. I think by referring to the whole church as the Israel of God, he's affirming that they don't need to do anything else to be on good terms with God in, in the true Israel. Although the Judaizers, who were not the Israel of God, we're wanting them to get circumcised and become part of their Israel. He says, no, I'm, you don't need to be part of their Israel. You're part of the Israel of God. Um, I don't really know if Paul is really trying to make the Christian Gentiles and Jews recognize themselves as one body in Christ, as he so labors to do in chapter 3. What, what does he gain by distinguishing between them, unless there is some difference 
that you can identify between Israel of God and, and the Gentiles. Uh, I think he's saying there's no dis distinction between them. Well, uh, we'll have to let that be a rhetorical question. And Chris, maybe you'll get a chance to answer that at some point during the Q&A um, or in your closing statements. At this point, we will thank you all for a great round of cross-examinations. That was very engaging. And now we'll allow Steve five minutes for his closing statements. Now, at this point, if you're in the audience and you would like to ask a question, this would be an excellent time to go ahead and type QUESTION in all caps and then ask your question. Uh, merely tagging me may um, add my name in uh, on YouTube's live screen, but in the software that I use, it'll be extremely helpful if you'll, in all caps, type QUESTION and then ask your question. If you previously asked a question, it would be helpful if you just ask it again, but I'll try to get to the ones that have already been asked. So with that, Steve, um, we look forward to hearing your, your uh, sorry, closing statements. All right. Well, I believe that ever since Mount Sinai, God has had a covenant people. Well, he did before that Abrahamic covenant, and we are it. Uh, as Paul makes very clear in Galatians chapter 3, the church is the Abrahamic uh, covenant people. At Mount Sinai, he took a smaller group, that were made up of some of Abraham's descendants and some who were not, and said, listen, I'm going to have a nation here called Israel. It's going to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and it's going to be made up of anyone who keeps this covenant. And there were Gentiles there who presumably did, and uh, anyone who didn't keep it would be cut off. So we've got a, a multi-ethnic group called Israel throughout the Old Testament. It is mostly made up of ethnic Jews and also had some small amount, probably, comparatively, of Gentiles in it. Jesus came and he called the faithful remnant to himself, and they became the disciples of Jesus. They became the church. And uh, it was mainly made up of Jews initially, just as, as it was in the Old Testament. Only this time it's just the remnant based on a new covenant. The old covenant Jews were based on an old covenant. That covenant is past. There's a new covenant, and now to be part of Israel because God made that covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's what Jeremiah said he would do. Uh, the, the, the first people to join that covenant were Jewish people who were, happened to be the apostles and, and eventually other disciples of Jesus. For many years, all those in that Israel of God were Jewish. But then eventually Cornelius uh, came in and then a whole lot of other Gentiles too. And it was understood that God has made no distinction between them. And therefore, all the promises of God are yea and amen, according to 2 Corinthians 1.10, in Christ, through us. And so all the promises, all the things related to Israel, that anything that made Israel different than anyone else, is all now fulfilled in those who are the, the faithful ones to the true new covenant. Being faithful to the old covenant doesn't mean anything, and being racially Jewish doesn't mean anything. Uh, God has never been a racist. And I realize people object to me saying that when they think Israel is special, but what else are you going to say? If they're not joined to God by covenant, if you're not defining them by covenant, you're defining them by race. And I don't believe God defines people by race. I don't think he ever did. Even Abraham and his seed were to bless all the families of the earth. It was not supposed to be just a one race of people. God never had any interest in one race only. And likewise, he doesn't now. So the gospel has gone out to the Gentile nations. And just like in the Old Testament, Israel's made up of Jews and Gentiles. The main difference is, in the Old Testament, the majority were Jews and the minority were Gentiles. In the last 2,000 years, those uh, demographics have shifted. Now the majority are Gentiles and the minority are Jews, but it's the same entity. It's not a different entity. It's still the house of Israel and the house of Judah that God made the new covenant with in the upper room. And uh, so we've got an entity made up of multi-race, and it always did. The difference is that since Jesus came, the promise to, that God made to Abraham that his seed would bring blessing to all the families of the earth has actually become a fulfilled thing, that uh, we are now Abraham, all of us Abraham's seed who are in Christ. And it's uh, still, it's still multi-ethnic. And I would not deny that there's people in who we could call Jews in a sense that I'm not a Jew, if we're talking about race, but God doesn't care about race. And so when it comes to God's identification of people in Christ, there's only one race. True, it's made of Jews and Scottish and Irish and Chinese and Brazilians, lots of different races, but in Christ, there's no distinction uh, on those things. So uh, the Israel of God, which from the very beginning was multiracial, still is. And uh, 
whether whether Paul used the term Israel or Jew more than once or twice to speak of Christians is, to my mind, totally irrelevant. I'm not sure why there's such a fixation on these particular words when the olive tree, the vine, the servant of Yahweh, the you know firstborn, the uh, you know holy nation, kingdom of priests, children of Abraham, all these terms are used of the of Christ and the church. The church is Christ's body, so we share in those. And so Paul uses seed of Abraham, for example, of Christ and of us. Um, and Jesus did the same kind of thing too, uh, although he said, if you were really the children of Abraham, as he was talking to people who were children of Abraham, so if you were really Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. So he's talking about uh, a smaller Israel too. When God, uh, when, when Paul said that Israel had all these advantages in Romans 3 and in Romans 9, he says they've wasted those advantages. They had those advantages, which should have made them shoe-ins for the kingdom of God when the Messiah came, but they didn't, they didn't take advantage of it. So um, he says that it has benefited them nothing, and only the true Israel is, uh, has come into those promises. All right. Which is awesome. Thank you, Steve. Chris, your closing statements whenever you're ready. Thanks. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, how fond I am of Steve and, and how much I appreciate his willingness to have this debate. It, it made it a lot easier to debate a topic that I have far less experience with than Steve does, uh, at which for, for which reason I was very nervous. And having somebody who was so kind and respectful and, and brotherly and, and whom I count a friend made this a lot easier for me. So thank you for that. Um, first of all, I, I, I think it is highly relevant, as I've already explained, um, not just that Israel and Jew are almost always, if not not always used of Jewish people. Um, it's also the fact that me, a great number of times Israel and the church are differentiated from one another without qualification, and Jew and Gentile believers are differentiated uh, from one another without qualification, as I explained in my opening presentation. It seems it seems very strange to me, it doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does seem extremely unlikely that if we can legitimately, in fact, more legitimately, if we're following Steve's argument, call the church Israel, then um, then how could it so be so easy to distinguish between the two of them without qualification? If, if Gentile believers are more truly Jewish than, um, than Jews are, uh, unbelieving Jews, then why are Jew and Gentile believers uh, so easily and so frequently differentiated from one another in the New Testament? Again, they're both believers. Yes, there's neither Jew nor Greek in Christ, and yet they are differentiated from one another without qualification. There's never, uh, you know, uh, Gentile, you know, you you Gentiles are Jews or anything like that. Um, and there's never there Jews and then Gentile Christians who are Jews in a truer sense. Nothing like that. There's no differentiation like that anywhere. And I think that's highly significant. I also I also argued that it's highly significant that in the places in Romans uh, nine and two where Paul creatively or, or, or you know he, he uses midrashic interpretation um, to uh, to to change the scope of Israel, he doesn't expand it. He narrows it. Um, he says it's not all of Israel that is indeed Israel. It's a subset within Israel that is truly Israel. It's not all Jews who are truly Jewish. It's a subset within um, the Jews that are truly Jewish. Um, and, and that seems to me far more consistent with my conclusion in today's debate, which is that um, the Israel of God is the faithful remnant um, now and into the future until Christ returns. Um, so I do think that uh, my case has been uh, unchallenged. Uh, I explained in my opening presentation why it's so much more appropriate that uh, Paul at the end of Galatians would be referring to Jewish and Gentile believers in the church. It's because he's just been denouncing Jews throughout his letter, um, but he at the, not only does he not want the Gentiles to become prideful and arrogant toward their fellow Jewish believers, but he wants the Jewish believers to understand he's not condemning them. So it makes perfect sense in a closing benediction to wish per peace and mercy upon both groups that are part of this one new man, not a, you know, he, he says, he, he doesn't say um, that there is an existing man into which Gentiles have been brought and some Jews have been taken out. No, it's a new man comprised of both these distinctions. And that perfectly explains why so much uh, language it was used to describe Israel, a kingdom of priests, um, you know, the, the, uh, the olive tree and so forth, why those things which are not synonymous with Israel, but did historically um, symbolize Israel, why it would make so much sense for those things to apply to the whole church, because those blessings, those um, uh, those properties that describe uh, 
Israel as the people of God naturally uh, describe Gentiles who have become part of this new man, not the pre-existing one that Gentiles have been brought into, but a, but a new community into which both Jews and Gentiles that believe are included. Um, so the fact that those properties, attributes, qualities that once described the people of Israel that were faithful to God apply to all people who are faithful of God, it does not follow, therefore, from that, that therefore um, the fact that those terms are used to describe the church, that therefore the church is Israel. That just doesn't follow. Um, I've only got about 55 more seconds, so I'll just say that I've explained in my rebuttal why I don't think Steve's case is convincing. Um, they were a mixed multitude, but hardly mixed at all. And the uh, and and the and throughout the New Testament, whatever the the multi ethnic nature of Israel was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Gentiles and Israel continue to be distinguished. Jew and Gentile believers continue to be differentiated without qualification, and um, proselytes in the New Testament are consistently distinguished distinguished from Israel, not just in the passages that I mentioned, but in others. Uh, you can um, you can read that in, you know, you can look that up and, and find out what I'm talking about there. Um, so yeah, in the final analysis, I think that Steve is absolutely right. There's a whole lot about Israel that is equally true of the church because those things were true only of the remnant of Israel. But it does not follow that therefore the church is indeed Israel. Thank you. All right. Excellent job from both debaters. I am so glad that we got to this point in the debate. Another fun part when we get to the audience Q&A. So, uh, well, wait a minute, Braxton. You, you should probably tell us who you think won. Uh, I, no, I'm just kidding. I, I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. Um, it's like two favorite rock bands here together. So, um, But anyway, uh, what we're going to do now at this point is we have a lot of good questions that have come in. I'm going to try to get through as many of those as we possibly can in the time that we have. And so if you still have a question, you can still type in all caps question, and uh, hopefully we'll get to that. But um, I'll try, you know, I'm just going to take these as they come. I'm not going to try to alternate between, uh, between persons because they seem pretty evenly distributed. First of all, um, we, uh, this, uh, let's see, Serafiel Abbott 2, I think, uh, maybe we'll try, wants to know if there is a way we can get PDFs of the PowerPoints that you both used tonight. Um, how about this? If that's possible, I will try to get those from the debaters and put a link in the show notes for this in the description. Uh, both men seem to indicate that that won't be a problem, so we'll try to do that. I can see how that would be extremely helpful. Um, all right, so here's a question from Michael Link. He says, uh, i to get this where I can see it. He says, do you believe... Any biblical promises to Israel, I guess this would be a question for Steve. Do you believe any biblical promises to Israel remain in effect for the racial Israelites? No. Simple. Simple answer. <laughs> if, if I would say yes, I'd have to identify one. And I, I'm familiar with all the promises in the Bible made to Israel, and they're all fulfilled. So I don't, I'd have to say no. All right. Um, uh, you know, we should say if there's any desire to come back on one of these things for, for just a brief response— that's uh, perfectly acceptable from the other side. Um, Chris, if you don't have a response to that, I'll move on to the next question. I'll just say that my personal answer to that question um, it has no bearing on this debate because all I've tried to argue here is um, what the word Israel and the word Jew properly apply to, whatever, whether or not. I think you can hold my view on no, that question and yet and yet affirm what Steve just did. And so I have I, I don't feel any compulsion to argue otherwise. I uh, should say at this point, we've talked about a future debate again on um, one of the spinoffs from this or one of the issues that this leads to related to perhaps salvation or end times or whatever else. So look forward to the possibility of that. All right. Uh, Jamie Russell, thank you for that substantial super chat. We don't require anyone to to donate to us, but we sure do appreciate it when it happens. Um, and Jamie says, was Abraham an Israelite or a Christian? What is Israel? Now, he didn't indicate a particular person to answer that. So um, do you guys have, I'll, I'll just let perhaps Steve go first. Go I think first. it sounds like it's Chris for him. First, first yeah. Oh, Chris, oh, oh Chris me? Feeling, okay. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, no, Abraham was not an Israelite, and I think it would be incredibly anachronistic to call any um, Old Testament saints Christians. Um, some of them, I think, were aware of the coming Messiah and were saved by their faith in in the coming Messiah. But I think it's perfectly sensible that there were plenty of Old Testament saints who were who were saved by their faith 
uh, in Yahweh. Um, that seems to be Paul's point in, in Romans. Um, it seems to be Jesus's point when he says that the Father who had life in himself has given life, uh, given it to the Son to have life in himself. That's, that doesn't mean that um, aseity was given to the Son. It means that the uh, the ability to the being the object of saving faith was given from the Father to the Son. And so I have no problem saying that there are plenty of Old Testament saints that aren't Christian, but are indeed saved. But since Christ, um, it's a different story. Um, but what I'll, what I'll hasten to add is it does not follow that because Abraham, I mean, I guess, I guess I wouldn't see how it would how an argument could, could extend from my concession just now that Abraham was neither an Israelite nor a Christian, um, that therefore uh, it, I don't see how that would lend itself to Steve's case. Quite the opposite. It seems to me to be um, if if Israel is the covenant people of God, then Abraham was Israel. Um, but no, the first Israel was uh, Jacob. Um, and so it, it appears as though Israel does, in fact, properly speak only of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not, say, Ishmael or Esau um, or any other descendants of Abraham that are not descendants of Jacob or descendants of or, uh, or descendants of uh, Isaac, I mean, or descendants of Isaac that were not descendants of Jacob. Steve, do you wish to come back on any of that? You know, uh, I, I don't agree with his conclusion on that point, but I do agree that Abraham was not either Israelite or or um, or Christian. He was a, apparently, uh, he lived in Babylon and he was a, Sh a Shemite, but he was not, you know, there, were no, there were no Jews or, or Christians at that time. All right, moving on. Here's a question for both. And since Chris went last time, perhaps we'll let Steve go with this one. This question is from Abby Alam, friend of the show. And she says, question for Chris and Steve. At the end of Revelation, aren't the saved, uh, aren't the saved people, which include Gentiles, called Jerusalem? Can you address that passage? Well, yeah, I believe that the in Revelation 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down out of God, is uh, is the church because it's adorned as a bride to meet her husband and in i think it's in verse nine if i'm not mistaken uh of chapter 21 uh the angel says to john come with me and i'll show you uh the lamb's wife okay well if jesus is the lamb then the church is his wife and he sees I, he says i saw the heavenly jerusalem coming down out of heaven so yes the whole church and certainly to distinguish between jews and gentiles at that point would be i, I think sacrilegious uh, the bride of Christ is the whole church, is the New Jerusalem, right? Chris, and therefore, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you're, if you're part of Ju Jerusalem, you're part of Judah, and the word Jew comes from the name Judah. Chris. Yeah, I, I don't agree. I mean, I do agree that the New Jerusalem there um, is the body of Christ and that that includes uh, both Jewish and Gentile believers. In fact, arguably a predominance of Gentiles um, if it's the church that descends with Christ when he returns. I, I, I suspect that um, uh, Steve and I are both amillennial there, and so we can just put aside the premillennial misunderstandings of that passage. Um, but no, it does not follow that if the church is the New Jerusalem, uh, that therefore the, um, the church is Israel. For one thing, there's still a Jerusalem, uh, and you don't, and the church isn't that Jerusalem. But but secondly, and more importantly, um, the language of Revelation in a number number of places alludes to Isaiah, the what, what has sometimes been called the little apocalypse in the middle of Isaiah. The reason it's been called that is because people have mistakenly thought that it is apocalyptic literature characteristic of the um, second century BC, like with Daniel and so forth. And so it's been mistakenly characterized as a little apocalypse. But in any event, I'm talking about Isaiah 24 through 27, and in this in, in this pericope, um, the picture is of of Jews returning from the diaspora to Mount Zion, which which is close, which is more synonymous with Jerusalem than Israel is, um, and and also they will be joined by Gentiles uh, on that mountain. Um, it says uh, Yahweh will swallow up death, the death that covers all peoples. So the picture that Revelation is drawing from in Isaiah 24 through 27 is not one in which Gentiles become Jews. It's a picture in which Gentiles join Jews at Mount Zion and um, celebrate the victory over death uh, that Yahweh will will work. So no, there's no indicate there, there's it does not follow from the church being the New Jerusalem in uh, Revelation that therefore the church is Israel. 
All right. This one says, question for Chris Date. This is from Isaiah Burridge. Do you believe Israelite believers have promises to be fulfilled that apply only to them and not Gentile believers? It sounds like he means uh, Christians sure. both. Um, are, there, are there promises to be fulfilled that only apply to Israelite Christians and not Gentile Christians? Well, let me preface my answer by saying that this is just my personal opinion. I'm happy to answer that question, um, but it does not at all follow necessarily from the case that I've made today. And I, and I say that because, again, I want to reiterate, you do not have to embrace the strength of my case, and I do think it's a strong case. Um, if you accept it, I mean, it does not mean that you therefore have to become a dispensationalist or agree with me on the answers I'm about to, I'm, the answer I'm about to give. Uh, my answer is yes, I think there there are. there are, And I think there are at least two. One is, I think that, G, that Paul is saying at the end of Romans 11 that all Israel will be saved means that corporate Israel will corporately one day return to her Messiah. And the reason is because that doesn't follow only after the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. The fullness of the Gentiles coming in is actually sort of an explanation of a picture just before that, which is that gen the Gentile branches can be grafted, uh, taken back out, at which point Jews will be naturally grafted back in. Um, and similarly, he says in Romans 9 to 11 that if their rejection meant life for the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead. This seems to be a picture that when um, when Jews corporately re-embrace the Messiah, um, as Gentiles are being broken back off of the, natu or the, the tree, um, that will usher in the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and so forth. So I do take all Israel will be saved there to be a reference to the corporate um, salvation of Jews, not apart from Christ, but through belief in Christ. And because I'm a Calvinist, I can easily say God can work that uh, supernatural miracle out through the regeneration of uh, Jews in the future. Um, so that's one promise. I think that the, the promise that one day Israel will corporately be saved. I don't, I'm not a post-millennialist, which means I don't think that a similar promise exists for most of humankind. Uh, and the other promise I, I would say um, is does in fact apply to the remnant of Israel um, are the land promises. I understand um, Steve's take on this, and I understand he's right to point to texts in the Old Testament which say that the land that had been promised to them, they took. But I take that promise to be um, a, a, an indefinitely lasting one. Um, and for them to be out of the land means that that promise is not in effect. And right now, the bulk of Jews in Israel aren't the true Israel. And so I think that one day, um, corporate, uh, when as the Jewish people corporately embrace the Messiah, that will also mean that the remnant of the Jewish people will um, increasingly be a part of that land, and it will properly be uh, belong to Israel. So, sorry, I've gone on for a little bit so, longer. It sounds like I would think that um, how you understand the nature of covenants, whether they're conditional, unconditional, and when, would have a major impact on this. Steve, do you have anything And to which add? are conditional and which are not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. Uh, as far as the land, uh, the promise being perpetual, I don't know where someone would get that, except from the places where God said that he would give it to them forever, which sounds perpetual. But he also says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that if they would violate his covenant, he says in verse 45 and 46, moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you, and they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. So the, the curse upon Israel is, when it comes, is forever. And when Jesus cursed the fig tree, which most people, I think, reasonably understand to be uh, representing Israel, he said, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And so uh, when Jesus told the story of the vineyard and the tenants, he said he sent all the prophets. And then he said, last of all, he sent his son. This is their last chance. And they killed him, too. So he said, therefore, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits of it. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the kingdom was taken from them. And there's no suggestion that it'll ever be given back to them or that the promises they forfeited and the curses they gained will ever be reversed. Uh, just as he said, he gives them the land forever. He said, but if you violate my covenant, these curses will destroy you forever. And so I, I guess it depends on what you want to do with the word forever. I consider the word forever to be related to conditional promises. You meet these conditions, this is yours forever. You don't meet them, well, then you'll be cursed forever. All right. Um, this is a question that I want to get to because this person asked it early on and was generous enough to, to uh, give a donation. Zach Tyndall asks, uh, 
a question for both. Now, now, I think that this was addressed a little bit after he asked this question, but the last part, perhaps not. Does the debate have any bearing on the Calvinist view of Romans chapters 9 through 11? Would adopting Steve's view remove these uh, supposed Calvinist proof texts? So, Steve, I guess you should answer first. No, they would not remove them. The, the Calvinist proof texts in Romans 9 are kind of uh, in, a, in a cluster together in, in the early part of chapter 9. Uh, but um, well, I guess some things about my view would change them because I believe that what Paul's trying to point out there is that not everyone who's uh, a child of Abraham is a child of the promise. And he points out that Esau and Jacob, for example, differed from each other in that way. And of course, the Calvinists would see that differently than I would because they think that Cal Esau and Jacob were individuals who were either elect or reprobate. Uh, and therefore, we have an unconditional election situation there. I believe Esau and Jacob were a case of unconditional election, but it's not choosing anyone to be saved or lost. We have no promises in the Bible that Esau will go to hell uh, or will be annihilated or that even that Jacob would go to heaven. This is about which branch of the family line will bring forth the promises made to Abraham. And it was Jacob's branch that was chosen unconditionally. Esau's branch was rejected for that. But uh, there's no there's no uh, election for salvation in my view on that. And so that, that would differ but the, the business about whether God chooses people to be saved or not uh, individually wouldn't really be affected by the particular view I hold about uh, the use of the word Israel and, and toward the church. But there are certain ramifications to some of those verses that I'd certainly see differently, and it would remove the Calvinist proof text uh, value of them. Well, Chris, I'm going to let you come back on that, but it's, it's uh, too bad that it's getting this late in the day for us to— bust open the Calvinist can of worms that we have here. But Chris, do you want to say anything in response? Don't worry, I'm going to keep that lid tightly on the can. Um, I, I agree with Steve that neither his view nor mine necessitates one view or the other of these Calvinistic proof texts. Uh, the only thing I want to say is I'd like to caution Steve against speaking universally of Calvinists as if all Calvinists understand the Jacob and Esau um, example in the way that Steve characterized. It's true that many do. Um, but in the next episode of The Apologetics, which will be this coming Monday, uh, September <laughs> uh, 21st at 6 p.m. Pacific, on the The Apologetics YouTube channel, um, I've got a recorded interview with a fellow Calvinist, and we go through this text in Romans 9, and we make explicit that we're not saying that Jacob and Esau represent a saved person and a reprobate person. Um, we argue that it's an example of unconditional election, uh, full stop, not a, unconditional election unto salvation, but unconditional election, full stop, and that that's uh, among the examples that Paul offers for, for demonstrating that this is the way God works. Um, so I just wanted to issue that caution. Not all Calvinists are the same. Um, but that having been said, no, I think he's absolutely right. Regardless of whether you take his view or mine, it doesn't necessitate that you um, accept these as Calvinistic or, or non-Calvinistic. All right. Not all Calvinists are the same. I had no idea. That's shocking. Um, <laughs> shocking, right? <laughs> all right. Here's an easy one. Whoever wants to answer this can. What is the literal meaning of the name Israel? You want to go for it, Chris? Uh, my my recollection is that Jacob was renamed Israel when he fought with God, and um, and, and I think it means it has something to do with that. Uh, he wrestles or fights or something like that. I agree. Fights it's God. Ambiguous. Very ambiguous. Some people think it means one who wrestles with God. Some say it's one who is a prince with God. But uh, not all Hebrew scholars that I've consulted would agree exactly on the definition of the word Israel. All right. And I'll and I'll just add it. Yeah. It doesn't seem to me that. Whatever you answer that question as, I don't think it necessarily, you know, necessitates one or the other of the answers to today's today's debate question. Okay, here comes a question from Coram Deo Assembly, which says, "Since those in Christ are Abraham's offspring, because Jesus is Abraham's offspring, wouldn't that promise only apply to God's one people, one holy nation, the Israel of God?" That sounds like it's for Chris. Chris. <laughs> Uh, so the fact that so the, I, I, this is what I tried to say in my rebuttal. Um, it's not all descendants of Abraham. It's not all of the seeds of Abraham. And again, I want to reiterate the word seed in the original was ambiguous. It could refer to many or singular. In fact, I think everybody would agree or uh, scholars would agree that in the original it was plural. It referred to the plural seed, the descendants of Abraham. What Paul is doing is exercising midrash. He's, he's coming up with layers of meaning. He's identifying layers of meaning in it, not saying it's one sole meaning was that it was referring to Christ. But anyway, um, it wasn't all descendants of Abraham that were Israel. 
It was only the descendants of Abraham and Jacob and uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Um, and then in, and in uh, Romans, Paul exercises some more midrash and says, even within that group, there's still a subgroup that properly identifies as Israel. So the fact, so descendants of Abraham aren't all Israel, and equally, it doesn't follow, therefore, that Gentiles who are now descendants of Abraham are equally Israel. You, you would have to say they are descend, they were descendants or seed, not just of Abraham, but also of Isaac and also of Jacob. Steve? Um, I, I don't have anything necessarily to add to that. Yeah, that was covered pretty well in the debate, I think, so good to get some clarification there on Chris's position. Um, Steve? Uh, Brandon Stahl wants to know, can we look at Revelation 2.9 as rebuking the physical Jews and the spiritual Jews if they are not faithful to the covenant? And for the audience, Revelation 2.9 says, um, this is the King James. Uh, no, this, let's see. I, I want to do the New American Standard here. I know uh, your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Yeah, and you find the same kind of statement in Revelation 3, 9, two different churches, the Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia, both were being apparently persecuted by the Jewish synagogue, uh, who say they're Jews, but Jesus, they, they don't, they, they're not worthy of the title Jews. They are the synagogue of Satan, not of God. And in that respect, I think Jesus, who's the speaker there, is reiterating what John recorded Jesus saying in another of John's books, where he said, you are of your father, the devil, you know that he saw that the, the non-remnant Jews, which were the ones who rejected Christ and persecuted Christ and the Christians, uh, they are not really Jews anymore. Um, they don't have any right to be called Jews. Now, that's an interesting point uh, as far as my part of the debate goes, because uh, Chris is arguing that the word Jew and Israel always are used of the ethnic group. And, uh, and yet, here he's talking to people who almost all scholars agree are part of that ethnic group, but they're not Jews, So, according to Jesus. So if people who are, uh, you know, Jewish are not really Jews, then it, it kind of breaks the pattern of using the Jews strictly to have boundaries that are ethnic. Chris? Right. So Steve, unintentionally, I'm sure, misrepresented my argument. I, my argument was not that Gentile or Jew and Israel are always references to any ethnic Jew in the New Testament. I said that there were a small number of disputed examples of each. And my argument was that those few examples, among which were included these two in Revelation, um, are Midrashic references to the Israel within Israel, the true Jew who's, circum who's a true Jew because his heart is circumcised. Uh, and in Romans 9, I've argued that that is not uh, people that aren't Jewish but are uh, spiritual Jews um, or aren't Israel but are spiritual Israel. No, it's an Israel within Israel. Uh, it's Jews within the gr larger group of Jews. And that's 100 percent consistent with Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. The fact that there are Jews by descent who are not truly Jews does not lead to the conclusion that there are therefore those who are not Jewish by descent, but are true Jews. All that logically follows from the statement that there are Jews claiming to be, but are not really, um, is that there's a subset within the superset. Um, you would have to make other arguments for, to, to say that there are other non-physical Jews who are also Jews. Agreed. All right. This question sounds like it's for Chris. Steve Vaughn wants to know, what purpose does ethnic Israel serve in the kingdom of God that God would see them different? I don't think that, um, I think this is the wrong question. I don't think the question should be, what is it about the Jewish people that warrant a designation like Jew or Israel that the Gentile believers do not? I think the question, the better question to ask would be, um, who gets to define um, whether a people group are called Jewish or Israel? And that answer is God. God is the one who gave them that name. Um, and I think that God is somebody who is a promise keeper. He's faithful. And I know that Steve totally agrees. But my point is that the reason I think it merit, we, we are still justified in referring to the Jewish uh, Jewish believers, at least, as Jews and, and, and uh, the Israel of God is because um, – Sorry, where was I going with this? Uh, the, oh yeah, because God is faithful to his identification of them. They are Israel, not because of anything special in them. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The Old Testament says that God chose them not 
because there was anything special about them, uh, but for his own purposes. And I think the same is true with their continued designation, Israel and um, uh, Israel and Jew. Now, that having been said, I will say I have already argued, and I know Steve probably doesn't agree, at least to a certain extent, um, but I have already argued that there, that the um, the preservation of the culture in which uh, these original Jewish apostles were steeped, I think there's still some of that culture preserved in the Jewish people today. Not 100% of it. In fact, quite a lot of it isn't. But, but I still think there's some of it preserved there, and I think that's consistent with what Paul says in Romans 11, that um, the Jews are more easily, more naturally grafted back into that tree. I think that's an indication that even today, Jewish people are more easily, more naturally grafted back into the people of God. And that's an indication, I think, that it's very plausible that the Jewish people will have insights into the interpretation of Scripture that even a lot of Gentiles, like myself, don't have, because they are closer, if even only a little bit, um, to the milieu, uh, to the Jewish milieu from which the scriptures arise. And so that's another thing that I think warrants a distinction between Jew and Gentile believer, is that they they may have um, uh, certain, uh, they, they may understand and appreciate and, and be able to pull out certain principles in the scriptures that maybe Gentiles aren't immediately um, uh, might be oblivious to. And, and one last thing, just because I meant to say this earlier, and I'll just say it now, um, the fact that there are if it's true that because they're Jew and Gentile are one in Christ, uh, that there's no distinction between the two, mean there's no significant distinction, then we should also say there's there's no meaningful distinction between Scottish, to use one of the examples that Steve gave, and J Japanese and a host of others. And yet I think God cherishes the diversity of culture amongst all these different groups. I don't think that there'll be ambiguous pe or non-racial people in the new heavens, new earth. We'll all still have our cultural distinctives. They just won't be salvific ones. And so culture is also a reason for thinking that it's appropriate to still call Israel Israel and not the church Israel. Steve? Yeah, I think that, uh, I, I, I think Chris places more value on Jewish culture than, certainly than I do, and I think probably more than God does. Uh, I don't know that God is that concerned about what language people speak or what they eat at dinner time and things like that, that those cultural things, what kind of music they, they enjoy. I think he's concerned about whether their heart is Christ's or not. I believe there's only two categories of people in God's estimation, and that is those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. And those who are in Christ, whether they be ethnic Jews or ethnic Gentiles, they're one, and there's the distinction is irrelevant. Uh, people who are outside of Christ, whether they're Jews or Gentiles ethnically, likewise, they're all, they're all lost, and it uh, doesn't make any difference. And that's what Paul argues very uh, strongly in Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, where he talks about those who seek immortality and righteousness and, and so forth, uh, they'll receive eternal life, the Jew and the Gentile. Jew first, chronologically, because they did chronologically, and the Gentiles also, secondarily. But then he says, likewise, those who are obstinate and disobedient, well, they're going to be uh, facing wrath and tribulation and, and so forth, uh, the Jew and the Gentile both also. Uh, he says, because God is no respecter of persons, meaning that Jews and Gentiles don't make a difference to him, you know, they're, if the bad ones are going to be burned and the good ones are going to be saved. And that's Paul's make it very clear. God doesn't notice any racial differences between them. OK, I'm going to take two more questions. I mean, the questions have just been flooding in. In many ways, this has felt <laughs> to me like an epic debate. Um, so I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. I certainly would love to. Um, Call my yeah. What's that? They can call my show. Oh, yes. And I'm going to give you both an opportunity. I should have done this at the beginning, and it's my fault, uh, to, to speak yourselves about your different ministries. But, yeah, Chris, uh, Steve has got a call-in show that happens every single day of the week. And uh, is it just days of the week, Steve? Week, weekdays only. Yeah. yeah. Five and, weeks. And, you, and you can find out about that at thenarrowpath.com, and he's going to tell you about it in a minute. But you, you can call in with any Bible question. He'll answer it. So if you think, well, I think I could stump him, well, then you'll get your chance. All right. Uh, maybe, maybe Greg Chesser will, Steve. He says, um, does Abraham have descendants who are not Israelites? You mean today? That's all the question says. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know if there's any Edomites still around or Ishmaelites. Uh, there are the, the Arab nations often think of themselves as descended from Ishmael, and their Ishmael was a, a child of Abraham. So, uh, yeah, Abraham might have children. Remember, God said he'd be making the father of many nations. 
Israel was only one nation of, of them, <clears throat> Edom, Midian, um, you know, Ishmaelites and, and many others were all descended from Abraham also. And some of them may be around, especially if the Arabs are correct about their link to Ishmael. Do you have anything to add to that, Chris? No, just that I, I agree. Um, now, plausibly, if the Arabs are um, descendants of Ishmael, but certainly between the time of Abraham and uh, Jacob and for a great deal of time thereafter, there were countless descendants of Abraham that were not Israel. Um, and, and so that's why I think that the fact that Gentile Christians are the seed of Abraham, among, along with Jewish Christians, um, does not therefore mean that Gentile Christians are Israel. All right, so we'll do the last question of the night. Well, I was going to give it to, to this person, but they've already had a question tonight. So let's, let's try to vary the menu a little bit. Um, he has two. Well, all right, here we go. Um, Micah Turner says, how would you explain Galatians 3 that places focus on uh, in the seed of Abraham being the promise to all nations rather than the specific Jews, which could not disannul the promise uh i think that would be i think that's Chris. Chris. Yeah. yeah yeah i think it is for me i'm I, but i'm not 100 percent sure i understand it i mean um again the, the paul is absolutely be, the, the this questioner is right paul is saying that um what qualifies a person as a seed of the promise made to abraham is not being an israelite um but so what? Uh, the, the, it wasn't only Israel that was descended from Abraham. The Ishmaelites were, and a number of others, the, the um, descendants of Esau and others. Uh, so I, I just know, see no significance there. Meanwhile, um, yes, Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, in terms of what God um, what God cares about salvifically, what makes a person um, worthwhile or have value. We all have value, uh, and, and we are all beloved by God, regardless of whether we're Jewish or Christian. And yet Paul's the same one who does offer distinctions between male and female elsewhere. Um, and if, if there's not, if, if God literally doesn't care at all in any way, shape or form, um, what distinctions there are between Jew and Greek, then it follow, it stands to reason, therefore, that he also doesn't care at all about the distinctions between Japanese and um, Arab and uh, Scottish and British and so on and so forth. And yet I think God cherishes and loves the diversity of culture in each of these cultures and the culture that is Israel. I think there will be um, Indians, not Native Americans, but Indians who have a very distinct cultural expression of their worship in Christ, and that will stretch indefinitely into the eschaton. I think that's a beautiful thing, and I think that will also be true of Israelite worshipers of Christ. Their distinct Jewish uh, uh, application of their culture to their worship of Christ is a beautiful thing that I think God adores, everybody as much as he adores the expression of, of uh, Scottish worshipers of Christ and so forth. So I see nothing in the context of Galatians that suggests that there's literally no distinction or that the seed of uh, being the seed of Abraham means that we are Israel, because again, there were tons and tons and tons of people among the seed of Abraham that were not Israel. Steve? There were people who were the seed of Abraham that were not Israel, but they were not the heirs according to the promise, only Israel was. And so when Paul says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, that would uh, mean he's not saying we're like the Ishmaelites or the e Edomites, we're like Israel, the heirs according to the promise that God made to Abraham. The other, other descendants of Abraham you know, they're, they're children of the flesh, uh, but they're not children of the promise, as Paul goes on to distinguish in Galatians 4. Well, listen, this has been an excellent discussion. Uh, I do have to throw up one last thing before we before we shut it down, and that is Trinity Radio Extra, which happens to be our second channel, which means this is Dr. Jonathan Pritchett. And he says, dang, this is good stuff from both sides. A rare debate worth watching. Thumbs up. <laughs> so that's high praise coming from JP. Oh yeah. Especially given that leading up to this debate he's been repeatedly saying how boring it's going to be and how people should just go watch football or something. <laughs> well, I will tell you, you know that uh, Jonathan loves you Chris and uh, right. uh, uh Steve is going to be with us here on campus next month and Jonathan said in the office today, I just can't wait till Steve Greg gets here. So <laughs> loves you both like I do. 
Um, all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Thank you, gentlemen, for a fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, very engaging. If you'd like to see Steve and Chris engage again on perhaps some related topic or some other topic, then let us know that in the comments to this video. I'd sure like to hear about that, and I'll pass along the word to them. Um, but before I let you go, I, I want to give you both a chance to talk a little bit about your own ministries uh, briefly. So, Steve, let's begin with you. Um, tell people where they can find you and, and uh, what you're doing and um, just how, whatever you want to talk about. Well, my website is thenarrowpath.com. And for the last 23 years, I've hosted a daily live program five days a week on radio stations. Well, originally on the West Coast. Now they're across the whole country. And it's a call in program. It's just it, the whole hour every day is just people calling in with any question they want to ask. And so that's what I've been doing for 23 years there. Uh, if, if you don't live in an area where we have a radio station, we're only on 30 stations around the country, so lots of you would be in areas where we don't have a radio station, you can get the app. The app is free. If you go to the App Store or to Google Play, just do a search for thenarrowpath.com app. Download it for free, and you can listen to the program every day or any of my thousands of lectures that are posted. Uh, you can listen to those right on the app. Uh, so that's, I guess, it. I, I have a few books I've written. Uh, one, one of them compares the different views of Revelation. One compares different views of hell. And I have two books I've written this year. Uh, they're not quite out yet, but they'll be out before the end of the year, both of them. And they are two-part series on the kingdom of God. Uh, the uh, title is The Empire of the Risen Sun. And book one is There is Another King. Book two is All the King's Men, which is about discipleship. So those books are coming out in the next few weeks, actually. Uh, you can find them on Amazon. Just look up my name, Steve Gregg, and books will come up. Yeah, and if you can't wait and you want to jump into one of Steve's books, um, Steve has a book, Four Views on Revelation. Uh, is that what it's called, Steve? I think it, it's I called think Revelation, it's called. Four Views. Revelation. There is no, there's another book that came out a year later called Four Views on Revelation. <laughs> but my book came out first. Chris is holding Revelation. it up to the screen for us there. <laughs> yeah, that that book you may even be able to find in your local bookstore if bookstores still exist in this apocalypse wherever you're at. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you should check that. I've been in many pastors' offices where they have that, and I was so proud to tell them that Steve is a personal friend. Um, so yeah, that's great. And we have the links to all of your resources in the description, Steve, including the links to your books on Amazon. Um, all right, Chris, t tell us a little bit uh, about you and what's been going. I really should have done this at the beginning. Please forgive me, gentlemen. No, I'd rather you do it at the very end so that people remember and go and check it out. They wouldn't have done that in the middle of a debate. This way it doesn't bias them during the debate. <laughs> right. And that too. That's exactly <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, I was holding up his, his book. This is this is at least like eight years old, and, and here's his, uh, uh, his signature that he gave me. It still means a lot to me. Um, and like I said, it was formative for me when I was a young preterist. Uh, I'm curious, Steve, are, is that still where you land? Is this a preterist? Oh, yeah, I'm a partial preterist. I probably just the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I hate that phrase, partial preterist, but yes, I, I, I share I, the same position. I, my, my next book is going to be actually a response to full preterism. So. You should change the name to a response to hyper preterism because it's full of something, but it's not full of preterism. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Steve mentioned his his uh, Multiple Views of Hell book. I interviewed him on the ministry for which I'm most known on that very book, uh, which is the ministry Rethinking Hell. People can find that at RethinkingHell.com. They can also find the Rethinking Hell podcast in um, iTunes. And we have a um, every other week uh, live show on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube.com slash Rethinking Hell, people will find it. Uh, we're on Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. And then um, on and, and in in that uh, topic, I've got a couple of books published and a number of journal articles. People can find the books at Amazon.com slash author slash Chris Date. Um, I've got uh, uh, two books on the topic of hell, but then I've also got a couple of other books that people might be interested in. Uh, and people can find my journal articles at my academia.edu profile, which I think is fuller because I graduated from fuller, dot academia.edu slash Christopher Date. And I've got a few journal articles there. 
The other ministry um, that I do on alternating Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific is Theopologetics, which is the first four word, letters of the word theology and all but the first letter of the word apologetics. So Theopologetics. Uh, and I it used to be a podcast. In fact, I, I moderated a debate between Steve and Michael Brown on the Theopologetics podcast. Well, now it's also a biweekly live show every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. People can find that at youtube.com slash Theopologetics. And lastly, I'll just say that unlike, unlike a lot of higher profile um, Christians and even lower profile Christians than me, um, I'm extremely accessible. I love receiving um, friend requests and messages. People can go to facebook.com slash Chris Date and find me. They can also tweet me at Date Chris. And the reason I had to do Date Chris is because Chris Date was already taken. And there's actually an even more famous Chris Date than me just in the area of software. Uh, and um, I thought there was something else I was going to say, but oh yeah, and if people just want to email me, just email me at chrisdate at rethinkinghell.com and I'd love to discuss anything you want to discuss. My only request is that we do so in a brotherly way, in the way that Steve and I have interacted tonight. So uh, thanks for, for hosting this, Braxton, yeah. and giving me a chance to plug those ministries. Sure, and I, and I do want to say again, I think I mentioned that you are a professor at Trinity, Chris, but Steve also has taught several courses for us, and um, and so we, we this is really a Trinity um, event all the way around. In fact, here is Soteriology 101, which we all know is Leighton Flowers. He says three great men right there. So um, I know he's he's a, a appreciates both of your ministries. So listen, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. So I love Leighton. I've never met him, but we've corresponded. And, I, and I, I've watched him on YouTube. I love him. I think you just made his night. I count him a friend. I count him a friend and, and love him as well, although, as everyone knows, he and I butt heads a lot on the Calvinist issue. <laughs> well, Steve would butt heads with him on the eternal security issue, so there you go. Um, <laughs> and we both butt heads with Leighton on the hell issue, although he's too afraid to discuss it. So, <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, this has been fantastic. Thank you all for being with me. And again, the links to all of your resources are in the description. Folks, I've enjoyed this. I'm Braxton Hunter. This is Trinity Radio. We sure would appreciate it if you would subscribe. It's not required. We can't make you do it, uh, and we won't feel bad if you don't, but we sure would appreciate it. It allows us to do more on YouTube because they unlock resources and ways to do things as you reach a different subscriber levels. But listen, uh, I, I see this as a great success, the first, hopefully, of many um, but strategic and important debates on Trinity Radio. I don't plan for this to be a channel where we just debate just for the sake of debating. But if it's an important issue and that video of a debate could serve as a resource going forward to benefit the kingdom, we certainly want to do that. Listen, I, I appreciate all of you for showing up. What a great live stream this has been. And we'll see you next time on Trinity Thanks, Radio. Thanks.